Good afternoon. Let's bring the meeting to order. Um, I think we have uh, is Ms. Wright here. Okay. Good afternoon and welcome to the National Capital Planning Commission's April 5th, 2012 meeting. Would you all please stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, for all in attendance, please note that today's uh, proceedings are being live streamed uh, on the NCP website. Um, and we do have a quorum, so without objection, we'll proceed along the lines of the agenda that's been uh, publicly, ad publicly advertised. Uh, agenda item number one is the report of the chairman, and you'll be happy to know that I don't have a report other than um, it is that time of the year to for the chair. Uh, appoints uh, the executive committee currently constituted as uh, uh, me and uh, Rob Miller as vice chair and Peter May as the third and final member. And with the uh, commission's consent, I would like to keep that same trio in place. Uh, so is there a nomination for, can we do them, these both in a block? So Second. A nomination to uh, keep Rob Miller as vice chair and uh, Peter May is a member of the executive committee. It's been moved, and is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Congratulations, Peter. Agenda <laughs> 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 yeah. um, item number two is report of the executive director, Mr. Acosta. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good afternoon. I just have a few items that may be of interest to the general public. Uh, NCPC's next speaker series event, Shades of Green, will be held on Wednesday, April 11th, 6.30 p.m. in the Commission Chambers. Representatives from five emerging eco-districts in the Washington region, including Walter Reed, Arlington, downtown D.C., the University of District of Columbia, and also NCPC's own eco-district in the southwest side, uh, will present innovations in finance, governance, policy, and design that are helping foster these sustainability showcases. Rob Bennett of the Portland Sustainability Initiative will also moderate uh, the discussion. So uh, there is a flyer in front of you, and we hope you're able to attend. <clears throat> on Thursday, May 17th, NCPC will also bring together a group of leaders and experts to discuss policies and best practices uh, for the planning of military bases and installations. Dr. Dorothy Robine, Deputy Undersecretary of Defense, Installations and Environment, uh, will deliver a keynote address prior to the discussion. Also, we have Dr. Mark Gillum, Professor of Architecture and Urban Design at the University of Oregon, uh, who also provided an in-depth look at the currently updated Unified Facilities Criteria which outlined the Department of Defense's uh, facilities planning, design, and um, um, standards. We'll provide the location and time of the event shortly. I know the Commission's been very interested and engaged in uh, the planning of uh, military bases in terms of master plan and how we review them and how the standards are set. So we hope that you will be able to attend that session. And we'll, again, we'll provide that information to you as soon as possible, as soon as we know. <clears throat> on Thursday, May 31st, on NCPC, the Trust for the National Mall, the National Building Museum will host a conversation uh, with the National Mall Design Competition winners. Uh, representatives from the National Trust uh, sponsored competition will share their ideas and images for transforming Union Square, the Washington Monument grounds at Sylvan Theater, and Constitution <coughs> Gardens. This program will take place at 6.30 p.m. at the National Building Museum on uh, May 31st. Also, the public exhibition of the design concepts uh, will be um, displayed at, on Monday, April 9th at the Smithsonian Castle and the National Museum of American History for those of you who are interested in seeing the competition uh, results. Uh, so that concludes my presentation. There's also a written report in your packet. Thank you. Uh, one question. <coughs> the, uh, um, the, the DOD meeting regarding facilities uh, master planning, is that kind of generally speaking or is it specific to facilities in the NCR? Uh, these are standard, these are master plan guidelines that apply to all military Generally bases speaking, throughout right. the uh, 
the country, uh, but uh, we'll also look at how they apply to certain instances here. Great, thank you. Mr. Uh, Chairman, yeah, please. Just add, um, I believe that the uh, competition entries will be on display for the full week starting the 9th. It's 9th through the whatever the day is, 13th or something. Okay, thank you. Uh, questions or comments to Mr. Acosta? Okay, um, agenda item number three is the legislative update. Ms. Schuyler. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have three items to report. Uh, the first is on uh, March 29th. This, a few weeks ago, the Senate passed House of Representatives Bill 2297, and I know you all know that that is a bill to promote development of the Southwest Waterfront uh, District, and that is really a bill that's intended to help clear and clarify the title for the property that's being transferred from the district to the developer. Um, this bill has previously passed the House, but the Senate did add an amendment, a minor amendment, regarding uh, uh, the, an Army Corps of Engineers navigation project for the, rational, the Washington Channel. So therefore, this bill has to go to conference before it can go to the president. But I think you can expect it to happen fairly quickly. Okay. Uh, the second item is uh, the introduction in the House of Representatives of H.R. 665. And essentially what this is doing is uh, requiring a pilot program as between GSA and the Office of Management of, of, and Budget uh, to conduct real property disposals for in an expedited basis, somewhat related to the civilian BRAC bill, but this is designed to have 15 currently declared excess processes, properties sold in an expedited process to see how that might work. And the third item is we have had passed the House of Civilian Property Realignment Act. Uh, there are now, and that has been referred to the Senate, but there have also been introduced two versions in the Senate. Um, they are in committee, but I think you will, can expect to see passage of that, some version of that bill in the Senate as well. Okay. Thank you. Uh, questions for Ms. Schuyler? Thank you. Agenda item number four is the consent calendar, and we have three items on the consent calendar. Item 4A is the travel camp phase one at Fort Belvoir. Uh, item 4B is the electric generating equipment at Fort McNair. And 4C is the electric generating equipment at uh, Joint Base Meyer Henderson Hall. It's been moved and seconded that the three items on the consent calendar be adopted. All in favor say aye. aye. Opposed no. Those are adopted. Agenda item number five, or 5A, um, is regards the building foundation and elevator coves for the National Museum of African American History and Culture. And we have Mr. Walton. Welcome. So good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of the commission. Uh, today, the Smithsonian has submitted the National Museum of African American History and Culture for final approval of the um, foundation and building core plans. Before I get into the presentation, I want to quickly go over the commission actions to date. Uh, the National Museum of African American History and Culture is a fast track project, and that means basically that the construction has started before the design is completed. Uh, because of that, the commission has seen more submissions for this project than typically they typically see in order to help the Smithsonian uh, keep their construction schedule. But in order to uh, minimize any confusion, I just want to quickly go over those actions, uh, starting with the uh, November uh, preliminary design approval. Um, that approval in uh, included the final site utilities, the support of excavation, which is also called the slurry wall, the excavation and dewatering. In June of 2011, there was approval of a gas line relocation. It was a gas line that was removed about, from about 50 feet into the site, closer to the curb line of Constitution Avenue in order to keep that construction schedule moving. Um, in April of 2011, there was approval of a, the revised concept design. And in September of 2010, there was approval of the concept design. Uh, that brings us to where we are today in the uh, foundation and building core plan. Uh, I want to start with a little background. Just as a reminder, uh, the site is located here along Constitution Avenue between 14th Street and 15th Street and Madison Drive at the, row of it, at the end of a row of existing museums on the National Mall. Uh, this more detailed version of the site plan shows that the building itself is set back 234 feet off Constitution Avenue, 136 feet off of 15th Street, um, 85 feet off of 14th Street, and 140 uh, to 90 feet off of Madison Drive. Now this is consistent with the preliminary design submission from last November. And it's also a key point for this submission because following this, the building's position will be fixed. Now that will not preclude further development of the landscape plan or of the building facades. Uh, since that preliminary design submission, the Smithsonian has started the site utility work, uh, which is nearing completion. They've also begun the construction of a slurry wall last month. 
Uh, the slurry wall in the case of the museum is actually a perimeter wall that wraps the site to keep groundwater out of the site during the construction process. Um, seismic monitoring was carried out last September and October to study the impacts of pile driving on the surrounding buildings and monuments. Uh, these triangular shapes that you see here on site represent the location of different uh, seismic monitors and the numbered circles represent the buildings and, mo and monuments that are being studied. Uh, the, the vibration test results have come back lower than the um, standard that was set um, and agreed upon by representatives from the agencies that uh, are responsible for the buildings and monuments that surround the site. As I mentioned, um, slurry wall construction started last month. In this diagram, the slurry wall is represented by the blue fill area here. Uh, the slurry wall, however, is really just a, a six foot wide, 100 foot deep trench that wraps around the perimeter of the site. Once the trench is completed, it's filled with concrete. And once the concrete is cured, um, the earth and water are removed from the site so that the groundwater is kept from entering the site during construction of the foundation, which is shown here in yellow. The yellow area actually fits within the perimeter of the slurry wall. You can see it better here in plan. So this is the foundation in the yellow boundary here. The blue boundary is the slurry wall. And you can see from the details that are taken from the four corner points in these intersections that the slurry wall is set back about uh, five to eight feet, depending on where you are around the site from the uh, foundation wall could be seen a little bit better, I think, in section. So this is the slurry wall out here. This is the foundation wall. The slurry wall is keeping water from coming into the site during the construction. The foundation itself uh, is going to be happening in phases. The first phase is going to occur here on the north side of the site. It's going to be a matte slab foundation. Uh, the middle third here will be second. It's a little deeper slab with piers below the core. The uh, core is here. And on the south side, the third phase would be matte slab and um, additional piers. Uh, these cores are central to the structure of the building and that they carry a large portion of the structure of the building itself. The four core uh, foundations, uh, the footings are shown, shown here in plan. And those four cores also serve as the vertical transportation cores for the building as they're integrated into the structure of the building. You can see the elevators and the stairs within the four cores. So with that, Mr. Chairman, the Executive Director recommends that the Commission approves the final foundation and building core plans for the National Museum of African American History and Culture. That concludes my presentation. Well, it's been moved and seconded. Before we go to a vote, is there any uh, discussion among commission members immediately for Mr. Walton before we have public comment? We do have one speaker signed up to speak to the building foundation and elevator coves, uh, Dr. Feldman. Dr. G. Scott Feldman is here uh, representing the National Coalition to Save Our Mall, and as such, we'll have five minutes to speak on this item. Welcome. Good morning. Um, I have a PowerPoint that, and the revised PowerPoint you received. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, good morning, Chairman Bryant and Commissioners. <clears throat> the National Coalition to Save Our Mall has participated regularly in the Historic Preservation Section 106 public consultation process for this museum since it began in January 2007. The coalition supports approval of the final foundation plans and agrees with the NCPC staff recommendation that the location of the building on site will be fixed with approval of the foundation plans. We also agree with the staff's determination that the work will not preclude further design of the building exterior or landscape. My testimony today focuses on that future landscape, in particular an alternative approach to what has come out of the Section 106 public consultation meetings. I've given each of you a full transcript of the PowerPoint presentation that is posted on the Coalition website at SaveTheMall.org entitled Improving the Mall Setting for the Smithsonian's National Museum of African American History and Culture. Also some illustrations. My comments today are distillation of that. Next slide. When I give tours on the mall from the Smithsonian Metro to the Washington Monument, I lose people at this stretch of mall between 14th and 15th, the museum location. People see a great void, a great dang dangerous expanse filled with roads and trees, uh, and traffic, sorry. Next slide. In fact, the Park Service's 1966 Skidmore Owings and Merrill Master Plan devoted a good deal of attention to this problematic area. That plan proposed to correct abrupt changes in grade between Independence to Constitution, bury the roads, and continue the rows of trees from the Eastern Mall all the way towards 15th Street. But that plan was never implemented. Now we have a major construction project with this museum and a wonderful, rare opportunity to make improvements. 
but instead of looking holistically at this section of the mall, the focus during the Section 106 process has been on maintaining the status quo. What is the alternative? Next slide. Existing conditions at the museum site show the isolated, irregular-shaped parcel bounded by the dangerous curve of 15th Street and the diagonal alignment of Madison Drive. The museum landscape is being forced to conform to this awkward um, setting. Next slide. But these road alignments are not historic. They were made only in 1997 to support 1993 plans for a tour mobile stop and retail gift shop on Madison and Jefferson Drive. Next slide. And an underground visitor center at the stone structure on, on uh, 15th Street. Next slide. The 2003 Olin Security Plan intended the lodge to be the entrance to an underground security screening area and tunnel entrance to the monument. But these plans all have been abandoned and with them the rationale for current awkward conditions. Next slide. The solution is to straighten 15th Street and realign Madison and Jefferson Drives to be continuous with the roadways of the museum-lined Eastern Mall. Next slide. The Stone Lodge could be relocated near the Sylvan Theater. Next slide. Continue the tree-lined landscape and gravel pathways of the Eastern Mall into this area and add new crosswalks to create a more pedestrian-friendly connection to the Washington Monument. These improvements will create a larger site for the museum and its landscape and make this a safer, more pedestrian safety and uh, friendly environment for visitors. Next slide. In the process, we would gain a new, smaller building site on the parcel along Independence Avenue. Importantly, making these improvements will not impact the time schedule for the museum building and can be implemented as the ongoing site and landscape plan review continues. An equally significant reason to seriously and equally consider this alternative is to protect the legacy of the plan of the City of Washington, D.C. at this long-neglected portion of the mall. Next slide. These improvements would restore the geometry and design of the historic L'Enfant and Macmillan plan. And next slide. And the concept of the mall cross-axis for this crucial connection between the museum-lined Eastern Mall and the Washington Monument. Next slide. In fact, the 2003 site selection study prepared by the Presidential Commission for the African American Museum chose this site precisely because it was consistent with the L'Enfant and Macmillan plans. Next slide. This approach conforms with the Commemorative Works Act, whose purpose, I provided the text in your handout, is to protect the legacy of the L'Enfant and Macmillan plans. And it follows the comprehensive plan for the national capital, whose poli policies include to, quote, protect and enhance the elements, views, and principles of the L'Enfant plan, and to restore historic streets and reservations that are not consistent with it. Next slide. The Section 106 process did not allow consulting parties to consider this alternative. <coughs> Based on National Register studies and National Park Service maps that identify this site as part of the Washington Monument, government president, uh, preservationists say that the landscape must follow the Olin Plan. Citing the Secretary of Interior's standards for preservation, they say that since 14th and 15th Street, this section of the mall was never completed as intended in the historic plans. It cannot be completed now. I'm almost done. But this current interpretation contradicts the comprehensive <coughs> plan and it ignores the fact that the L'Enfant Macmillan plans have only slowly been realized over more than a century. As former Commission of Fine Arts Chair Jay Carter Brown used to say, and his successor David Childs also said, the mall is still a work in progress. Final slide. I have spoken with traffic engineers and others who say that the alternative the co coalition proposes is both feasible and desirable. I believe it's time to revisit now how we plan the mall res with respect to the historic plans and urban design legacy that President George Washington created at the founding of the Capitol. As I wrote in my letter about the Eisenhower Memorial published in the New York Times last Friday, the plan of the city of Washington is a work of art in its own right, and we as planners, historians, and designers have an important role to protect it. Given a choice of the current conditions that are a reflection of obsolete projects and the vision of L'Enfant that is the basis for Washington's unique power, the historic plan should be given precedence. The coalition asks NCPC to help lead the much needed discussion about the value of the L'Enfant plan in comprehensive plan today and in this project in particular. Thank you. Thank you. The agenda item before us today is on the found building foundation and uh, elevator coves. Your remarks were largely on a different matter. Did you have remarks specific to the building foundation and elevator coves? Well, I believe these were specific because it was actually in, in the, in the um, staff report about um, this not affecting the future. Um, 
As for the actual foundation, um, we're happy to see that, uh, that studies have been done about a potential impact on the Washington Monument, and we hope that the Smithsonian also is uh, talking with the Ge National Geodetic Survey, which is in the process of evaluating tilt and the height of the monument to make sure that nothing untoward has happened since the earthquake. Okay, well, thank you. But I hope you believe that this was relevant because as the ongoing discussion happens, um, it's important these things be said earlier rather than later when it's too late. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll now return the um, matter to the commission. Additional discussion on the building foundation and uh, and uh, building and the elevator coves and the EDR that's before us. Uh, uh, Mr. Provencher. Just some uh, positive comments. I think it's uh, important to uh, commend the designers for, for a variety of things. It's important, I think, to a distinction to, to make sure that the, the approval of the uh, motion before us actually has two parts, the concrete foundation as well as the, as well as the bearing vertical core of the building that's going to be uh, made of reinforced concrete. I think the designers are to be commended for the concept of putting these piles all the way down to bedrock to give a, uh, a, 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 a more solid and uh, stable foundation that's uh, resistant to almost everything except for uh, earthquakes. This seems to be also very uh, respectful, uh, attentive to the concerns of the neighboring uh, properties and uh, memorials uh, meeting uh, the standards that they have set, uh, particularly on the vibration and the noise, the frequency, the duration, the extent, and so forth. So I think there's a, a lot of very um, commendable and collaborative activities that the, the designers uh, are, uh, have uh, succeeded in, uh, in accomplishing and, and should be commended and applauded for that. Thank you. Other discussion? Mr. Walton, the construction schedule is largely where it should be at this time? Yes, it is. It's moving along pretty well. Charlie, the construction schedule is on, on point? Mm -hmm. Yes. Good. Any additional comments or questions? Hearing none, the EDR is before you. All in favor of the EDR is presented, say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. It's approved. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Walton. <coughs> Agenda item 5B is the site improvement and, per and perimeter security at the Department of Commerce headquarters, <coughs> the Hoover Building. We have Mr. Hart. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of the Commission. The uh, project that's uh, before you today is the site improvements and perimeter security for the Herbert C. Hoover Building, which is the headquarters of the Department of Commerce. This was, uh, project was submitted by the General Services Administration uh, for a concept site development review. A little background, the building um, uh, opened in 1932 and at that time, it was uh, considered the largest office building in the world. Um, it is 1.2 million gross square feet, and it houses the Department of Commerce, the White House Visitor Center, as well as the National Aquarium. For recent commission actions, in 2006, GSA uh, submitted concept building modernization plans, and these included perimeter security. The commission um, uh, approved the uh, concept building modernization plans, um, but at the time uh, did not take an action on the perimeter security, noting that um, the security needed to be uh, reevaluated um, as it was uh, actually at the, the curb, and I'll dis dis describe that in a few minutes. In 2007, the, uh, commission, the G General Services Administration uh, submitted preliminary and final building modernization plans that did not include the perimeter security and the Commission approved that, uh, those, those building modernization plans. And finally, in 2010, GSA uh, submitted concept for a design for the National Aquarium Entrance Pavilion, and the Commission noted that uh, GSA, uh, the design for the uh, National Aquarium Entrance Pavilion um, uh, did include um, the potential for future um, perimeter security uh, in one of the, uh, the, the, the south wall, and I'll show that in a few minutes. This is the project location. Um, the site is uh, located in the Federal Triangle. 
and it is um, bound by Pennsylvania Avenue to the north, Constitution Avenue to the south, 15th Street is on the west side and 14th Street is on the east side. It is just north of the National Museum of the African American History and Culture, which you just heard a few minutes ago. The, um, also included in this, um, wanted to show where the White House Visitor Center is, which is to the northern, on the northern portion of the, uh, of the site. And then the uh, National Aquarium, the future home of the National Aquarium, um, is on the southern entrance, uh, southern side of the site near Constitution Avenue. The images on the right of this slide are showing um, the main pedestrian entrance to the Commerce Building and um, also the perimeter security, which is um, a row of actually planters. Um, and also we have the ve vehicular entrance. There are um, active vehicular barriers. We also re usually call them delta barriers, um, as well as um, uh, a guardhouse and some other um, elements. So perimeter security planning. The um, National Capital Urban Design and Security Plan, um, it is a guiding document for perimeter security projects in the district. Um, the relevant objectives are, are summarized here. They are to protect the design principles of the historic plan of the district, um, to balance physical perimeter security with the vitality of the public realm, and finally to um, also understanding that there is an acceptable uh, reasonable risk for buildings that are um, located in an urban environment. An important policy um, for the project is li listed here uh, about impacting public space. And it is for existing buildings in urban areas, perimeter security barriers should be located within the building yard when the size of the yard is greater than or equal to 20 feet. And if less than 20 feet, the barriers may be located in public space. The proposal that, um, that is before you today is important because it is a good example of how the plan can be utilized to create a um, perimeter security solution that respectfully balances the need for providing an appropriate level of security while minimizing impacts on public space and pedestrian flow. So um, looking at the, a comparison of what was submitted in 2006, um, this again was the concept from 2006. Uh, showing the um, perimeter security uh, itself. That's the darker line here. Um, and um, since this was proposed in 2006, GSA has worked hard with, the, um, with commerce uh, security officials as well as um, NPS, uh, DDOT, and, uh, and NCPC staff on developing security measures that balance the security needs with the public access to and around the building. And I'd also like to point out that uh, the property line is um, shown in here as well. So the security perimeter was um, well, with, well outside of the property line in the uh, 2006 uh, case. Um, this is the, uh, Wasn't there a proposal at one time, or am I confused, that actually even extended perhaps into the roadway? The only thing that's been submitted to us has been the 2006 um, uh, perimeter security. Okay. Um, but, uh, that's the only thing that's come before us officially. That's, that, okay. that's correct. Okay. Yes. Um, here's the, uh, the security perimeter itself um, that's being proposed now. Um, this perimeter is um, a little hard to see, but it wraps around the building. Um, it is uh, generally on the property line, which is here. I've also shown the uh, 2006 uh, security perimeter in the very thin line that's, that's right out here. So uh, this has changed um, uh, since the 2006 uh, security perimeter was, was submitted. Um, the plan now, um, as I said, reduces the impacted area um, uh, while make, uh, maintaining the necessary level of protection for the Commerce Building. Um, GSA has worked with NPS um, on the um, northern, this is the northern or Pennsylvania Ave side of the building. Um, this is the Constitution Ave side of the building. Uh, GSA has worked with NPS um, because NPS has uh, jurisdiction on, the, uh, on Pennsylvania Avenue and is um, uh, managing the White House Visitor Center, which is um, the main entrances on this side. Um, both agencies have, uh, are supportive of this, um, this new proposed alignment. And this is just to get a little clearer view of what the, what's being proposed here. And I'll talk about what these uh, little indentations are, their little niches in the, uh, in the design. So the uh, perimeter security elements, the GSA is proposing a cable rail system, and this consists of piers. Um, they are uh, terminal end and interim piers. They're all uh, clad in stone. 
Um, these piers actually uh, encase uh, bollards, and uh, a cable will connect each of the bollards together. Um, you see the, uh, the, the horizontal elements here. The vertical elements are the piers, um, and the horizontal ones are the, uh, are the, the railing or the cable. Um, all of these sit on a stone curb that connects all of the elements. Um, there are also walls. This is a curved wall at, the, um, at each of the four corners. There are cor curved walls. And uh, there are niches um, as well incorporated into the design. Uh, independent of the cable rail system are bollards, which you see uh, down on the bottom left. And these will, um, currently they're looking at a steel sleeve to go over top of them. Um, also active vehicle barriers and uh, reinforced elements such as flagpoles and pedestrian lights. Um, so we've talked about uh, the National Urban Design and Security Plan a little. Um, the uh, staff is supportive of the alignment that GSA is proposing um, and, um, are and we are suggesting some minor design modifications for GSA to explore um, as the design progresses. Um, they are broken down into kind of overall uh, uh, suggestions as well as um, some specific uh, suggestions. The overall suggestions are um, uh, then also divided into uh, some the number of elements that are being proposed. Currently, GSA is looking at 13 um, elements, uh, different types of elements. It seems as though they're, this is somewhat cluttered, and uh, it may be helpful to reduce the number of uh, elements that are being uh, uh, proposed. The rhythm or the proportions of the, uh, of the elements is also a piece, as well as the materials being um, uh, uh, suggested currently. Um, specific uh, comments are around Pennsylvania Avenue and 14th Street entrances, the National Aquarium entrance and uh, entrance pavilion wall, uh, vehicle barriers, and um, seating at the curved walls at the, uh, at the corners. For the National Environmental Policy Act, or NEPA, and the National Historic Preservation Act compliance, uh, GSA um, is going to um, amend the 2006 um, environmental assessment for the uh, modernization project um, and uh, include um, the perimeter security in that. And then for Section 106, uh, the uh, GSA will um, uh, initiate consultation with the D.C. Uh, State Historic Preservation Office as well as NCPC staff in the near future. Um, what I'd like to do is to kind of walk around some um, key points in the, uh, in the design and walk around the building and, and uh, talk about uh, a few of the um, areas of, uh, um, uh, in, in, in detail. This is the White House Visitor Center entrance. Um, it's, the entrance is, itself is here. These are um, pedestrian entrances into the, uh, the building. Um, the uh, GSA has worked with NPS and, in, and consulted with NPS about the um, location of the uh, perimeter security. And GSA is, is, um, uh, is looking to install um, the perimeter security. And, and in, in doing so, they need to remove uh, four trees. And these are trees that they're removing. Um, and um, the proposal is to have the curved um, walls uh, transitioning to the cable rail system. Um, um, bollards at pedestrian entrances, um, and the areas that are um, on either side of the White House Visitor Center entrance um, actually create raised beds um, at, those at those locations. So this would be a low wall, um, and it would be um, one point that people could actually sit on fairly, um, about a 30, 36, 30 inch uh, wall that, that would be there. Um, in detail, in the detailed look, this is the, uh, this entrance in a little more detail. Um, staff is, um, we would like to um, uh, uh, suggest that, that GSA look at the spacing of some of the elements. These are um, bollards as well as um, pedestrian lighting. Um, and look at the spacing to make sure that there is um, adequate uh, space for pedestrians to move through um, easily without um, um, being too, uh, too pinched. Um, this is a view looking at the entrance itself uh, with the bollards and then the pedestrian lights and the low, uh, low wall. For, for the uh, main pedestrian entrance uh, into the Commerce Building, this is along 14th Street in the, uh, towards the middle of the street. Um, GSA is proposing a, um, uh, cable, the cable rail system with the niche walls 
and that transitioning to um, bollards as well as reinforced flagpoles. Um, you see the uh, flagpoles and bollards here with the a little portion of the uh, cable rail system wall here. This will be 44 feet from the um, face of the, uh, of the building and a 20-foot 20, 20 sidewalk. And this is actually uh, the existing condition. This is the same line that's being carried uh, today. Um, as with the Pennsylvania Avenue um, side of the, uh, of the proposal, um, staff is looking at, uh, is, is requesting the GSA explore the, the, the position of these uh, bollards and reinforced elements um, to make sure that there's adequate space for people, pedestrians to move through. And this is the Constitution Ave um, uh, side of the building. Uh, again, the um, uh, perimeter security comes down to uh, Constitution Avenue from 15th Street. Um, this is a, uh, a wall transitioning into some bollards. Bollards are generally the, um, the main uh, access or the main vehicle for people to get through to, uh, to the um, pedestrian entrances. Um, and then for the, uh, the entrance of the National Aquarium, um, the National Aquarium itself is a below grade facility. The uh, main door is located here. Um, these are stairs going down to it and a ramp going down to it. This is a, um, what we call the south wall. And there are bollards, one bollard here and one bollard here that would protect the, um, the entrance of the, uh, the stairs and the ramp. Staff, uh, at the June 2010 meeting, the National Aquarium Entrance, uh, National Aquarium Entrance Pavilion concept was approved by the commission, as I said a little earlier. And at the time, um, the commission noted that GSA was designing this wall to include uh, perimeter security. Um, in the, uh, and staff supported that. Um, and this was primarily because at the time, the perimeter security was, um, proposal was actually at the curb um, and not the, the current proposal. Um, now staff is recommending that GSA explore the potential for um, actually <coughs> reinforcing this wall. Um, and the reason for that is that uh, when perimeter security is in the south wall, um, that the wall act thickness has to get um, fairly large. It's about a foot. Um, and we're looking to see if we can minimize that um, because it is in public space. Um, 15th Street, uh, again, following the uh, cable rail system with the niches. Um, this is uh, 27 feet um, from the uh, building face. And um, for the um, proportions of el uh, for the elements or the rhythm of the elements, um, staff understands that um, there are some of the elements actually line up with the, uh, with the building facade, but there are some elements that don't seem to line up and staff would just uh, uh, ask GSA to look at um, how that rhythm can be uh, maintained um, uh, along the, uh, the length of the, uh, of the building. And then for um, vehicle entrances, um, uh, staff is, uh, is, this is what's being proposed now with um, active vehicle barriers uh, at, the, uh, at the entrances. Um, staff is suggesting that um, GSA um, make sure <coughs> make sure that as uh, the location of these are being um, determined, that there's adequate space for the vehicles to be um, kind of stopped and screened and pedestrians to be able to walk through um, along, the, uh, along the street. Um, there's also a suggestion about um, when there are entrances that are, n that are not used as frequently, uh, the possibility of using retractable bollards or movable bollards, uh, movable bollards um, instead of the uh, the active vehicle barriers. And then for materials, uh, staff is um, suggesting that um, GSA continue working with um, DC State Historic Preservation Office as well as CFA and, um, and NCPC staff in developing um, the types of materials um, for, the, uh, for the perimeter security. And um, with that, staff is very um, supportive of the, of the project and um, recommends that the commission co comment favorably on the proposed concept design for the installation of perimeter security elements at the Herbert C. Hoover building um, and commends the General Services Administration for developing a design for perimeter security of a building in, uh, that is well integrated into the urban fabric of the surrounding streetscape and um, also uh, recommends that GSA explore the following as oh, the overall design of the proposal progresses work to simplify the overall security design, 
by minimizing the total number of different elements to uh, create a regular pattern and style for the security elements so that they align with certain architectural features of the building. Continue to refine the cable rail detail, ensuring that if a horizontal element is used, that it, that it complements the architecture and historic nature of the building and landscape. Consult further with, the, uh, with NCPC, CFA, and the uh, DC State Historic Preservation Office on the materials used to ensure that they are compatible with the historic context, uh, context of the Federal Triangle. And further recommend that GSA explore the following, use more um, uh, specific details, use more modern looking active vehicular barriers at the vehicular entrances, locate the active barriers such that vehicles waiting to be screened will not block pedestrian movements, allow for barriers to be only used at the most active vehicle, en vehicle entrances, incorporate perimeter security in the rear wall of the National Aquarium Entrance Pavilion rather than the front or, or south wall in order to reduce the width of the south wall and its impact on public space, Modify the spacing of the security elements at the Pennsylvania Ave and 14th Street sides of the building in order to maximize pedestrian clearances and avoid the creation of narrow, unusable spaces. And evaluate the potential for seating along the walls at the corners of the, uh, of the building. And uh, finally, notes that GSA will need to coordinate, uh, continue coordinating with the District Department of Transportation Public Space Committee and the National Park Service on the security elements to be located in public space. And that concludes my presentation. We have to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Walton. The overall modernization of the Department of Commerce building has been with us uh, for quite a number of years now. And the uh, Commerce Agency staff and the GSA staff have been very diligent in working with us and all should be commended um, for longevity and stick to The uh, This phase of the perimeter security has been especially um, important topic of conversation and it's been with us for quite some time as well and this to my eye seems to be a very nice uh, nice resolution very nice design um, with that other comments or questions on on this very important this, this project is very important in terms of perimeter security not the least of which is due to its uh, um, the prominence of the building on Constitution in Pennsylvania and its proximity to the White House grounds so it's, this has been a very important project, not one to be underestimated uh, at all. Again, other questions or comments? Uh, Ms. Greenville. Um, can you just describe to me the active vehicle barriers that are currently proposed and what are sort of the more modern alternatives that are referenced in the recommendation? Yeah, it's, they're a little hard to see, I think. Um, but currently, they're, um, they, most people refer to them as delta barriers. They're literally a... Um, a, a, a a thing that slides up and then, you know, the vehicles are, are not able to come in. Um, and I guess it's looking at um, what's there now, it just seems a very utilitarian type of thing. And there may be a, uh, an alternative to doing that. And we're just suggesting that, uh, that GSA look at uh, alter, uh, alternatives for doing that. And there are some that are kind of um, U-shaped, kind of um, inverted U-shaped ones. Mm -hmm. That are um, that have a little bit more aesthetic uh, design to them. And would match the arches nicely. Well, you well <laughs> didn't say that. Um, and I guess then the other question is: at the beginning, you sort of discussed that there's a certain amount of risk that's taken on when a you know a federal building is located within a city, and I understand that, and that's certainly true. But it's not clear to me exactly what is the risk. I mean, it is in a high-risk location, but exactly what is the risk assigned to this building and exactly how much risk they're taking on through this perimeter design? I think we should um, have uh, GSA, GSA's uh, representatives are here. They can answer that. Before. First, it's a it's a level five if for, because Le of location. Oh, it's four? Yeah. yeah. Oh, oh, five. No, sorry. Yes, of <laughs> course it's four. Um, it, because of size and location. But I before we launch into more of the detail, I did want to take some time to thank um, uh, the Department of Commerce because for those of you who have been following this project, um, it it was not their first choice to locate the perimeter security. Um, uh, their first choice was to have it out in the sidewalk, which um, is not our first choice, and they have very graciously acquiesced to the location um, in the building yard. So that's a big victory for GSA, and um, 
uh, victory is probably a bad word. That's a huge concession by the Department of Commerce, and we want to make sure that everybody understands that, um, number one. Um, and uh, number two, before on a on just a larger kind of design, um, uh, from a larger design perspective, this is um, an expanse that could lend itself to um, a, a great deal of monotony. So yeah, we do recognize that there are, there is an abundance of um, of elements that we're experimenting with, but um, uh, and we do need to. Um, we do probably need to simplify a little bit further, but oversimplification could lend itself to just so many elements marching down the street um, and become um, um, pretty toxic in its own right. So it, it's, we're very aware of that balance. I just wanted to put in a preemptive defensive argument um, uh, for we, we get that it's a vexing problem and we're not there yet. Susie, you want to address more yeah. competently the, um, the, the security? security. Um, when we started, Susie Hill, Susie Hill GSA, I'm, I'm the NEPA specialist and, and we're working on this project and have been for many years now. When we started to look at moving into the building yard, we really engaged with Department of Commerce's security staff, and, and some of them are actually here, to look at the risks of moving into the building yard. And, and this went up really high level within Department of Commerce that they were willing to um, accept the risk of, of a less of a setback on the compromise that they will be able to get perimeter security. So, so they recognize that there was a, a trade-off there that in order to get perimeter security, which they understand is important for the building, they needed to assume a certain level of risk moving the, within the building yard. And uh, we did a number of studies looking at approaches to the building, um, um, those kinds of things to look at where were the most vulnerable parts of the building. And we do actually get where the most vulnerable parts on 14th Street is where we do get quite a bit within the building yard, more of the setback that we need within the existing conditions. Is that? If you want to switch to the 14th Street side, if you look where the perimeter security line is there on 14th Street at the entrance, we do get quite a bit of setback there within the existing building yard. And that's where we've identified as the higher risk to the building from vehicle. Um, I'm just confused. If that's the higher risk area, shouldn't the perimeter be further out, not closer to Well, 14th Street is actually where we get more setback there. If you look at that, um, it's okay. a wider setback. So Sorry, okay. yeah. We do get wider setback, setback on 14th Street. So yeah, okay. so that's where we, you know, that's the, sort of what we looked at in terms of where we can locate the perimeter security on the building. So just to get a little bit more specifically into the security aspect, <coughs> if it's a level four building, this kind of countermeasure is designed to protect what level building? I mean, are you protecting this as if it were a level two building or a level three? It's, it's still protected as if it's a level four. So the, the cable rail system, all of those are being designed to protect it as if it's still level four. So the, the rating of the elements that we're using is still at a level four. So the compromise is really the location yeah. of those elements. Yeah. And, and the building during the modernization has also gotten the, the, the blast film on the windows as for the protection to the building and occupants. Okay. That's, that's helpful to understand. And I sort of bring up the question um, because outside of this, we've looked at a lot of perimeter, perimeter security issues and security issues, broadly speaking. And I, it's helpful for you to go into this level of detail. And I hope all the other commission members sort of understand the security that risks that these buildings face. Uh, a question of clarification on the, what you're calling niches. What are they all about? They're, they're really, um, I think I have one that's a little more detail. Oh. Uh, I think it's farther back. Uh, um, there, there it is. Um, they're really just um, areas for kind of, if you want to stop and, and call, talk on the phone and you're not in the, uh, the, the, the sidewalk area, if you wanted to look at a map and, you know, there are a lot of, uh, a lot of tourists that are kind of walking up and down 14th and 15th Street. So there are places that people can kind of walk off on the so side. So this could be a location for 
pedestrian benches. Right, we, and we are exploring benches yeah. in those locations and, and working with CFA on, on a good design for benches. And yeah, I mean, this is the public realm, and, and I, I appreciate the yes. fact that, you know, part of the solution has to, you know, reach out to the pedestrians and the population mm -hmm. in general as well as provide the security. And, and this is, uh, to Preston's point earlier, th this is an important project to establish for a, a vocabulary for the entire triangle. Um, I, I, I'm loath to say a kit of parts because it makes it sound like we just kind of do a true value <coughs> hardware approach to the rest of the triangle, which we, is not our intent. Um, but we are trying um, to establish a vocabulary with this building. And because commerce is the biggest one, and because it has this, these, these long, um, this inexorable march to the mall that the tourists are making, you, ha you really have to break it up. And um, the, the niches, I think, um, are an attempt to do that and also serve a purpose um, to provide some resting places for people when they're not, you know, in the, in the melee of pedestrian traffic. There's, so it serves two purposes. But it's still um, my favorite line. This is design concept. Um, we're, we're working a lot of things out. Ms. White. I just wanted to compliment the staff at NCPC, GSA, and Commerce for working in this way. And um, from the perspective of the at-large member, I mean, you guys are setting a standard here that's going to be copied in other parts of the country. And this is so much further ahead than the initial sort of hardening um, elements that have been used around the city. So I was really delighted to see the sensitivity to the public realm and the opportunities for increasing that um, pedestrian experience and giving places to sit. Um, also, I really like the way you wrote about these issues without using a lot of jargon and have, having people understand the appreciation between the um, need for security and balancing the need for the experience of the public realm. So I thank you for that. Mr. Provincial. Appreciate the comments of the, some fellow commissioners that also had similar questions about is this is like a lot of security, but appreciate the confirmation that this is appropriate security based on the level uh, assigned to this uh, building. And also the question about the niches, we had some questions also, the purpose, the, the value, the cost, the, the, the benefit. I think the report talks about seating and wayfinding, so appreciate that. But it also, again, reminding ourselves that it's design concept it appears that it's a step up as opposed to at, at grade, which is a little bit of a access uh, barrier if that's the, the, the final design. Um, I'm, there I'm, was- I'm sorry, which, which part of that? It appears that the niches, you have to step oh, no, up to, no. to no, get you're, into you're the walking, niches. You're walking in- According into, to- it's, it's, at, it's, at, it's at grade. Fig, figure seven on page 10. It's okay. they're, they're, so they're at grade. grade. Okay, thank you for yeah, confirming that. Okay. Um, it talks about uh, stone clad again, acknowledging that we're at design concepts. Stone, stone clad walls to match pavers, to architecturally match the adjacent building, to match. Well, I think currently they're looking at matching the building, good, um, good. but okay. I think that that's still being kind of discussed and, and what that what that is going to be. Gotcha. Uh, appreciate the niches are they are the right niches in the right places? For example, do folks queue up and or rest on 14th and 15th and not on Pennsylvania and Constitution? which are primary entrances to the building? There's yeah, no, they, 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 they do that. It just at, appears at that there's sides. more niches on 14 and 15 where the entrances to the visitor center is on the north and the aquarium on the south and there are no niches on the north and the south. Unless you say, well, the lines are so long and they queue up around the corner so the people at the end of the line can't sit down, but the people at the front of the line. There are benches, there are benches on are. Pennsylvania Avenue already. Okay, good. And, and we're, we, we propose to keep those in place. Gotcha. Looks like on the 14th Street side, too, there was reinforced uh, flagpoles. Looks like there's existing flags hanging off the building. Uh, we got redundant flagpoles now, more, more flags than we need. We, we, we would have... take them off of the building and replace them. Um, original plans for the building actually had them mm -hmm. uh, in that location on the street, so on the, in, in the sidewalk. Okay. And the last uh, uh, comment was from the September 07 meeting, it looked like there was two areas of concern, perimeter security and streetscape elements. This is submitted as a perimeter security proposal, but not as a streetscape element proposal. That being said, it appears that 
all of, if you would just confirm, all of the streetscape elements are included in this proposal, so we're actually approving both. Well, what's, despite what's being submitted as just perimeter security only? This is perimeter security. There are some streetscape elements actually on the Pennsylvania Ave side uh -huh. um, because of the removal of uh, a couple of trees that are right, that right. are there and the the, the grass panels okay. um, and the uh, um, raised bed that's along Pennsylvania Avenue as well. So this proposal includes then, just to clarify, all of the streetscape elements. So approval of the perimeter security also in indicates approval of the streetscape elements. So that we will check checked off both of those that they're that they're looking at from September. That 7. they're looking at for this. Yes. Okay. Got it. Thank you. Quick question. Um, one of the recommendations was to locate the active barrier such that vehicles waiting to be screened won't block the pedestrian movements. Can you show me what you mean? Uh, me so I could get there. Um, just along along the uh, really along here because of where the pedestrian uh, the sidewalk is uh -huh. and then the entrances are here and here and if there's a way to to have the vehicles be able to fully come into um, the the kind of the property um, without having that the blocking that uh, that pedestrian so who is who who are what are these vehicles are they are they employee parking what what are the vehicles that are being screened here um, they are I, they are, there, some there is employees, parking. There are motor courts within the building, so there's employees that have parking. So they're being screened, and then and it's really just an ID check, and then they can move in and park within the, <coughs> the courts of the building. And and what's, you know, what's it, it looks like? There's only the the depth of maybe one car. Yes. So, where would they move the screening so that they could that the, that queuing wouldn't block uh, the pedestrian access? Well, I, I think again, is it, it's looking at having these move um, in at least having one car that's that's able to um, to be in here without uh, again blocking the uh, the pedestrian uh, realm. It's uh, I don't think it's seen as being uh, a number of cars queuing up to get in here. Right. It would just be one car stop, ID check, and then move in. Is 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 how the the that operations work. Okay, I would just suggest that that might be more of a, uh, there might be more operational design than simply changing the dimension. Anything larger than the dimension of a single car would probably, even if it's like one and a half car lengths, would probably encourage a second car to try to pull in. So I, I think that that's something that actually has to be designed, um, especially we're entering our peak tourist season now. and. You know, I'm, I'm sure that you've seen and uh, employees of uh, commerce have seen the incredible increase in pedestrian traffic, you know, in this in this area. And uh, uh, and I, I find our tourists are uh, are a wonderful boon to the city, but they are often not looking for traffic hazards. They're looking around at other things. Um, so just just a thought there, and not to be churlish. I don't say this churlishly. Um, I do appreciate um, how. Uh, how how much an improvement this is over the 2006 security perimeter, uh, but I would still urge um, uh, GSA to take all the security out of the of the public realm, um, you know that that can possibly be taken out, and if there are other ways with these urban buildings to uh, to harden. Uh, exterior walls and not uh, affect the public realm, especially for a building in this prominent location that's designed to be a destination for visitors. That would be uh, that would be greatly appreciated. But again, I appreciate the progress that's being made. I, I can't wait to see the next iteration. Thank you. You can be as churlish as you want on this subject. <laughs> <laughs> when. Uh, is the estimate for assuming all approvals uh, that construction would start on this? Any idea? Um, Susie, I think we're looking at within the next what six six months? Spring of thirteen. Spring of thirteen. Sorry, Spring year. Of 13. Okay. to start construction. Yeah. Okay. So a year. Yeah. Okay. And then um, coming back for preliminary and final mm -hmm. June, July, a, a couple months down the road. Okay. Um, and that it, it is RF funded, so we do have those right. sort of schedule limitations and constraints. Yep. Additional questions or comments? 
Hearing none, the EDR before you, uh, is there a um, motion on the EDR before you? It's been moved and seconded. The EDR is presented to be approved. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. It's approved. Thank you very much. Agenda item number 6A is the District of Columbia Commission on Arts and the Humanities 5x5 uh, five five Temporary Art Program. And Ms. Moulton is here. Welcome. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of the Commission. In partnership with the National Cherry Blossom Festival, the District of Columbia's Commission on Arts and Humanities has developed 5x5, five five, a temporary art program. This spring event is the work of five curators, each tapping five artists to create a total of 25 unique public artworks throughout DC. And I'm, I'm pleased to introduce Mary Beth Brown and Deidre McWilliams to, from CAH who are here today to provide an information presentation on the program. 5x5 five five brings temporary art to all eight wards of the district, which is really an unprecedented achievement that's taken over a year to coordinate. After a fall 2011 call for curators, 25 works were developed and dispersed throughout the city, and many of them are mobile and will actually engage multiple neighborhoods. While the main purpose of the program is to encourage residents of DC to get out and experience the artwork, 5x5 five five also provides the opportunity for visitors to the city to explore areas beyond the National Mall too. Temporary art is an increasingly popular way for cities to enliven the public realm. Whether it's through a surprise performance of opera at the Smithsonian Castle or an outdoor art projection on the Hirschhorn, it really provides a fleeting but significant shift in the way that we experience life beyond our front door. Temporary art is supported by a number of NCPC documents, including the federal elements of the comp plan, the Monumental Core Framework Plan, and the Memorials and Museums Master Plan. And with more federal and local agencies committed to creating a dynamic public realm, staff anticipates an increasing number of temporary art projects through the NCR. While NCPC doesn't typically review an event like this, staff did want to bring this to the attention of the commission just to highlight the importance of public art and, and of the use of temporary art specifically to activate the public realm. There are a number of thematic links, too, between an event like this and other programs such as Beyond Granite, uh, the temporary commemoration project that's currently underway with NCPC and GSA. Uh, this time, I'd like to invite Mary Beth and Deidre to walk you through some of their 5x5 five five projects. Good afternoon. My name is Mary Beth Brown of the DC Commission on the Arts and Humanities. I just wanted to thank you for giving us this opportunity to present 5x5. Five five. The DC Commission on the Arts and Humanities is responsible for providing grants, programs, and educational activities that encourage diverse artistic expressions and learning opportunities. 5x5 five five was conceived through our Public Art Master Plan. The Commission selected five curators who in turn selected five individual artists or artist teams to each create a temporary public art project. The result being 25 temporary public art installations of various shape sizes and mediums installed throughout the district. Hi, my name is Deirdre Allen Mac Williams, and I'm the managing consultant for the 5x5 five five project. On the screen is an overview of all five curators and each of the 25 artists. Each project is a temporary intervention that activates space in a new and creative way and encourages residents and visitors to explore within and beyond the monumental core. New York curator Amy Lipton's curatorial focus is on contemporary art and its relationship to the natural world. She has chosen five artists whose work addresses biodiversity in both scientific and cultural terms. Biodiverse City is the title of her 5x5 five five curatorial work and refers to the wide variety of ecosystems and living organisms including humans, animals, plants, and their habitats. The project shown is Brandon Bellinger's outdoor light installation for the National Zoo entitled Love Motel for Insects. Bellinger is finishing his PhD in biology and has created a similar installation in both Asia and Europe. At each location, the anthropods leave traces and create abstract pheromone paintings on the fabric surfaces. These works have become the backdrop of community events such as picnic picnics, scientific investigations, and music and dance events. Justine Topfer is an Australian curator based out of San Francisco. 
Her 5x5 projects are designed to breathe new life into the ordinary, reinvigorating the fabric of urban environments under the curatorial title, Betwixt and Between. The masculine virility and stamina driving Jefferson Pinder's performance, Ben-Hur, draws out the historical, social, and political issues tied to race and identity. This endurance performance opens up a broader narrative to explore our collective experience of human predicament and struggle. Local curator Laura Roulet is focused on transforming the production and reception of public art. Activate Participate is the title of her 5x5 five five curatorial work, and each of her five projects creates communal, multi-sensory experiences for diverse audiences. The project shown is the Floating Labs Collective Re-Museum. The Floating Lab Collective's Collective has transformed a truck, normally used for selling tacos, into a roving museum. The truck functions under the premise of accessibility, participation, roaming, and integration of displaced communities. This roving museum meets with residents to explore ideas of what belongs in a museum, who defines what art is, and how is art valued. Floating Lab Collective asks, asks members of the community to bring objects from their home that is meaningful to them. Floating Lab then casts these objects like a hair comb from the first African American beauty salon on Capitol Hill, or a teen's microphone. These objects have been displayed at the Corcoran Gallery of Art, shown on the screen, and at the Pepco Edison Gallery. This coming weekend, the works will be on display at the Deanwood Recreation Center and on April 14th in Anacostia. Richard Holland's Head is our only international curator participating in the inaugural 5x5. Five five. He's from Northeast England, and he decided to work solely with artists from that region of the UK. Kath Campbell, one of the five artists in Richard's curatorial work entitled Magnificent Distances, which brings an outsider's view of DC to five by five. His projects explore the iconic DC, but also the domestic human DC with its complex histories and communities. Marathon by Kath Campbell, as you see on the screen, is a working scale model of the original <coughs> cable car from Mount High, Japan where the gift of 3,000 cherry trees came from 100 years ago. Threading through the concrete pillars of the Yard Park lumber shed, Marathon draws attention to the scale and empty volume of a building that is emblematic of wider social shifts away from manufacturing towards a leisure and recreation-led regeneration. Steve Rowell is a bi-coastal curator whose 5x5 body of work, Suspension of Disbelief, investigates the fringes of the monumental core. Airspaces, zones of exclusion, perimeters, liminal landscapes, waterways, shorelines, perceived non-places and lesser known or overlooked memorials. The project shown Temperance Fountain by Kunst Republic, a Berlin-based artist-run collective, revolves around the layered histories in DC of the temperance movement of the late 19th and early 20th centuries and the highly influ influential straight edge punk rock music scene of the late 1970s and early 80s. Both of these movements in very different ways highlight the values of social reform, activism, and counterculture. The research from this project has been realized as a replica of the temperance fountain found just around the corner at 7th and Indiana. Our fountain roams throughout the city and is used as a focal point for public gatherings, musical events, and talks. So we just want to thank you again for taking time to review our project. As you can see on the timeline, we began unveiling projects on March 20th. Programming will continue to take place through July, with the last work deinstalled July 20th. Thank you. Thank you very much for a city that so highly values public art. Uh, this is a, quite a nice exhibit and, and undertaking. Um, Mr. Coney? I just wanted to uh, say bravo to our commission. Excuse me, your microphone is on. I just wanted to say bravo to our commission uh, on arts and humanities for um, this really wonderful event. Um, they've been uh, you know, they've clearly done a wonderful job selecting curators and, and artists, and 
uh, and all around the city, um, I think they've uh, they've really succeeded in uh, in in creating these focal points of commentary and uh, and interaction that have been that have been great. Um, they're uh, uh, they have a particular collaboration with uh, with our office uh, of planning. Uh, as part of a grant that we received, a national grant called uh, from a new foundation called Art Place to specifically over time activate uh, uh, with arts-based installations uh, and activities uh, four different neighborhoods in the city. And uh, they've already mentioned how one uh, 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 on on uh, April 14th with uh, um, with Illuminate Anacostia, one of those four uh, projects. How how uh, the some of the mobile uh, uh, um, uh, art works are going to uh, congregate in uh, in Anacostia, but we're doing them also in Deanwood, uh, in Brookland, and uh, Central 14th Street. So uh, I think so many of these things are a commentary on the nature of the federal city versus the you know the the, the other city, and uh, uh, and I think a lot of these things really captured that uh, that unique dynamic uh, in Washington D.C. And I just wanted to commend you. Thank you for coming and, and telling us about this uh, this great program. Thank you. I just wanted to also say thanks. I um, appreciate the installations, and there's one near my apartment, and I've been enjoying it for the last week or so. So thank you for the work, and uh, I look forward to visiting other installations. Mr. Provencia. Uh, compliments on the program. Could you share with us the size of the grant so we get us a, a concept of the scope of the project? Yes. Each each of the five curators was allotted up to a hundred thousand dollars. Okay. All right. Impressive. In some previous presentations, for I think as I recall, September of '09, we had a capital space plan presentation in February 2010, activating federal places. And we saw a variety of concepts shown, such as uh, plinths, like they have in uh, London. Is there any plan to put permanent displays for the temporary art exhibits? Or is that part of the concept? I can say that the DC Commission on the Arts is very intrigued and very excited with this first dive into temporary public art. And London's fourth plinth project is a wonderful example. Mm -hmm. and. I can't make any promises, but it's something that we're interested in exploring further. Excellent. And I do want to add that it's laid out in our master plan, our public art five-year master plan. Mm -hmm. And that particular project is highlighted to think about a permanent place for rotating public art. Great. You cited the uh, memorials and museum master plan, the comprehensive plan, the core framework, and added beyond granite. It is also consistent with, informed by, under the auspices of the capital space plan and the activating federal places initiatives are all these is there some synergy and linkage I would, between I would these initiatives? certainly say that there's synergy um, I, I think overarching uh, the overarching principle really is to activate a space whether it's through um, local government uh, nonprofits um, all of those plans certainly advocate mm -hmm. for an activated public realm right do you have an outreach program, for example, if uh, uh, federal agencies were to invite you, if we wanted to launch similar programs on a smaller scale for our facilities and campuses? Mm -hmm. Do you have do you have that type of of a service available? Yes, um, <laughs> it would just more generally be connecting with our office. Okay. Through through me, for example. All right. And setting that up. Very good. Thank you. Ms. White. I was noticing in your brochure that you invited people to reach out to you if they had an idea for an event or a program, which I think is a really clever way to do outreach. I'm curious, what kind of response did you get that came from the community or another organization? That was actually Deirdre's idea, so I'm glad you appreciate it. Um, we've, I think, um, we have a lot of interest in tours. We haven't seen a lot of them happen yet, but a lot of people reach out to us and want to do a bike tour or a bus tour. And so we're actually working on doing tours on the 14th and the 21st to coincide with those events happening in Anacostia. As Harriet said, um, Illuminate, which is happening from the DC Office of Planning's Art Place grant. So hopefully we could do a tour to some of the sites and then end up at the Illuminate Festival in Anacostia. 
And in addition, the reason why we're sort of doing this crowdsourcing idea for events is because the project is installed through July, and we're just two people, and so we want to think about really ways to get the community involved in 5 by 5 and feel excited. So if anyone's interested in hosting a picnic or a barbecue near one of the sites, because it really draws people out into the district neighborhoods and kind of takes the burden off of us as well. That's very clever. Yeah. I wish you a lot of luck with it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very exciting. Thanks. Agenda item number 6B is the D.C. Clean Rivers and Green Infrastructure Projects. And we have uh, Ms. Coster. Thank you, Chairman Bryant and members of the Commission. Uh, I'm pleased today to be introducing George Hawkins, the General Manager of D.C. Water. Uh, Mr. Hawkins will be updating the Commission on the Clean Rivers Project. Uh, D.C. Water is under a 2005 court-ordered consent decree to build a massive tunnel uh, to control combined sewer overflows to the Anacostia and Potomac Rivers. Uh, this work is already underway with the construction of uh, the first tunnel. In addition, Mr. Hawkins will be talking to you uh, about the proposed green infrastructure pilot project. This is a fast-track proposal uh, to see if a green, low-impact development approach could reduce or eliminate the need for the additional tunnels that are not yet under construction. Uh, it will, the pilot project will affect 50 acres in the western side of D.C and could cost from 10 to $30 million. Uh, while this approach uh, could be almost as effective as traditional infrastructure, it could also provide green jobs and enhanced environment and greener neighborhoods. Uh, we wanted the Commission to hear about these projects because they do touch on federal and district interest issues. Uh, first of all, NCPC has already reviewed three of the Clean Rivers projects, and we would anticipate that you would see this work uh, continuing to come before you. Um, in addition, um, the kind of green infra infrastructure approaches um, that are being proposed here are very consistent both with uh, administration objectives on sustainability as well as NCPC's own policies and our work uh, such as uh, the things we're proposing in the Southwest Eco District. So there's a natural synergy there. Uh, I think we have long supported the idea as well of clean uh, rivers and a clean Chesapeake Bay, which is the ultimate goal of all these projects. Um, I'd note DC Water has been um, actively seeking support for the pilot project proposal, which requires EPA approval. Um, the Commission typically does not take action on information proposals. However, if after the presentation you would like to direct staff uh, to do any further follow-up, we would be happy to do that. So with very little further ado, I'll introduce Mr. Hawkins. Mr. Hawkins, welcome back. Thank you, Chris. Thank <clears throat> you for dressing up for us. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, we would mistake you for a Harvard lawyer or something. <laughs> I came in downstairs and they directed me to the back where apparently yeah. there was a problem. <laughs> It's a, a very funny. I go to the Wilson building and they want to let me through and just want to know where I'm working. So yeah. maybe those movies where someone dresses up and gets in works. But it does have its advantages. Um, my name is George Hawkins. I have the uh, pleasure and honor to be the general manager of DC Water, which is your water utility for the region. Delighted to be here um, to tell you about an exciting prospect uh, that is before us. And perhaps you'll decide. You, certainly good for you to know about it no matter what you decide to do, but perhaps you'll consider um, supporting it. We are seeking support from a variety of audiences uh, for this approach. Um, before I start, the reality of what we're doing at Blue Plains, this is a picture when we did the kickoff ceremony for this project. Uh, that is Blue Plains, and obviously you see uh, the mayor and the congresswoman and a number of folks in the project. Um, yet last night, I, we had a board meeting for DC Water this morning, so I actually wore this to the board meeting. I wear this every day, actually, where, wherever I go. Um, but I was going, leaving late preparing for uh, the board meeting, and I was stuck between two cement trucks that were leaving our plant. Just to give you a sense of the scale of work we are undertaking at, at the uh, site, 
three nights a week, we are pouring 1,200 cubic yards of concrete. If you've ever seen the giant trucks with the circular back, that holds about nine cubic yards of concrete. So last night we had 137 full concrete trucks come on our site and pour concrete. We do that three nights a week. And currently we have about 600 trucks a day leaving and entering our site given the scale of the construction. The largest project of which is this one, but there are three uh, major projects. I'm gonna just summarize all three of them then it'll go right to the presentation. One is a project called Enhanced Nitrogen Removal. It is governed by a permit issued by the US EPA. That is a billion dollar project. We will be done by 2015. Uh, it's won't be, it will allow us to be one of the most stringent plants reading nutrient removal uh, requirements for the Chesapeake Bay. That is actually happening now. If you drive by on 295, you'll see about 10 big cranes closest to the road. That's the nutrient removal project for the Chesapeake. The second is one of the most interesting projects. We're building the first in North America and the largest in the world, a digester project to turn the solids at our facility uh, into energy. It will be the largest source of clean, renewable energy um, in the region, 13 megawatts of power. Um, that's a $470 million discretionary project by the board. It's cash flow positive from the day we turn on uh, the system, and if uh, we can demonstrate that it works, there's facilities all over the country watching the project because the technology hasn't been used in North America, but will likely turn every water and waste wa every wastewater authority into a power plant, which they should be. Um, just to give you a sense of scale, 60 full-size tanker trucks, we're not quite the size of this room, leave our plant every single day with solid material we're removing from the wastewater. Half of that will be used in, these pow in this power plant to produce uh, clean energy. And then the third is this project, which is, which is Clean Rivers. Um, this is a consent decree mandated project. Signing on to the consent decree in 2005 was the mayor of the District of Columbia, the chair of the board of DC Water, um, or the, the, the US EPA, Environmental Protection Agency, and US Department of Justice. So we are mandated to do this project. There is a very specific requirement for the project, its timeline, and its time frame, which is what we're implementing today. And what we are proposing is a alternative pilot that might change the direction of the project that we think is exciting. And that's what um, I want to describe to you um, now. Uh, so first, um, just to give you a sense of the project and its scale. The problem, as you know, is, is from combined sewers. You probably know this as well as anybody. By the way, it is great to see so many of my friends. I know many of the people on this board are not all, but myself and Harriet. I, Council Member Wells and I will be at a public meeting tonight where this will be one of our issues. We're going around the city and doing public meetings in every ward and with every organization, and Ward 6 is tonight. Um, so I will be seeing him shortly. Um, but it's great to see you all. Uh, this, the, the, as we know, in the older part of the city, which is this purplish section, the pipes that were designed to carry wastewater are the same pipes that are designed to carry stormwater running off the street, why they're called combined sewers. It was much better than the alternative at the time. The challenge is that no matter how big that pipe is, in a big storm it will fill up. And when they fill, the question is, what does the, the new flow coming into the pipe, where does it go? And there's sort of two choices. Uh, it could either go back where it came from, because there's no more capacity in that pipe, which would mean sewage going back to buildings, stormwater runoff from streets, staying in streets, which would mean all the underpasses would fill up. I mean, the city would literally stop functioning on a public health and a transportation basis. Or you allowed an overflow. So essentially, you allow a relief valve that allows flow to go out of the pipe to allow new flow to come in. That's called a combined sewer overflow, or a CSO. It's how it was designed. This was not by accident. Uh, but the problem with that solution, obviously, is while it's better than having sewer backups into homes and businesses and having the city stop functioning, that means a combination of sewage and rainwater is going directly to the river without any treatment. And in an average hydrologic year, about 3 billion gallons of overflow go some to each of the three rivers of the city, the Potomac, the Rock Creek, and uh, the Anacostia. The consent decree designed to resolve this problem 
uh, is the, the largest piece of this is a 13 mile tunnel which will proceed up the Potomac, the Anacostia, that's the Nationals ballpark. We have a, a, the main and O pump, well you of course know this map very well, but we have our main and O pump stations there. So there's a big shaft where we're gonna be putting, that. this is Poplar Point. Second phase will go up to RFK. A third phase will actually go into Northeast DC. These shafts are actually are not for combined sewer. Many of you know there's historic flooding in Northeast DC. Since we had a tunnel so close to historic fl flooding, we agreed in the remedy to add additional tunnels to solve that flooding problem, although it's not a CSO problem per se. It's just taking the benefit of the tunnel since we're so close to solve a historic problem. Currently, we are building the first phase of this tunnel, which is here. Um, that is uh, the largest contract DC Water has ever entered, design build for $330 million. That is a current project undergoing, and we, will we are just now in the uh, process for awarding this contract, which will also be design build, and then we'll move to the next phase. This part uh, is not part of our proposal to do a pilot. One of the messages that you need to uh, uh, understand, some of you have heard this before, we are, what we have proposed to EPA would not change the building of the Anacostia side of the remedy. We are, we are planning to build it. In fact, of the 3 billion gallons of overflow in the average hydrologic year, it's a long way of saying we had to pick an average year to estimate how much rainfall and what our remedy would be. And actually use three years, you take a worst case scenario in essence, and that becomes your average hydrologic year. Preston will remember all this from uh, his past days. Um, but two thirds of the overflow in the entire system in the average hydrologic year occur on this side of the city. So since there's such a large, two billion of the three billion are on this side of the city, we're gonna build these tunnels because Anacostia is also a much slower moving river. So any contaminants going into the river have more ecological consequence because they sit there for longer. So we are building this and we have not proposed to modify any aspect of the Anacostia side of the project. What we are considering or have proposed to EPA is whether or not a low impact development, green development, green roofs, porous pavement, redesigning streets, all of the elements that you've heard that Harriet has talked about and is designing into the city, whether we did it at enough scale, could we capture enough stormwater so that instead of building an underground tunnel, which you don't see, has a great consequence, but you don't see it, instead you change the landscape of the city, city on a broad scale if you could capture enough stormwater, you might pick that as an alternative. That's not in our consent decree. We can't do it unless there's an alternative pilot allowed. And it would be, at least what we've proposed, is potentially for the Potomac Tunnel and the Rock Creek Tunnel. Um, so uh, the two that we are, the proposal is for, this is the current Georgetown, uh, in Georgetown for the Potomac, overflow to the Potomac. Um, the, the, the other reason why, by the way, we have selected these two aspects is as a practical matter in the timeline of the consent decree, Georgetown is phase two and the Rock Creek Piney Branch uh, Tunnel is phase three. So they actually happen in phase later in the consent decree. The Anacostia Tunnel we're building right now. So we'd have to actually stop construction, stop work of what's already been done. In this case, we have not started designing these projects. So if we push them back in time to see if a pilot would work, we haven't lost the work we've done because we haven't had done it yet. Um, so this is the uh, tunnel. The, one of the uh, interesting aspects of the Georgetown Tunnel, there's no question it'll be harder to capture enough stormwater at the surface in Georgetown than it might be otherwise because of the level and scale of existing development. There's just not as much open spaces to do the green work we want to do. On the other hand, that's also an opportunity figuring out how to do green development at this scale in a more classic urban context is one of the issues that we hope that the pilot could resolve because we would put pretty significant money into this project. The plan was for us to start facility planning by 2015. Uh, we think we're gonna have to move that forward because, <clears throat> uh, because of the consequence and scale of this tunnel, there's an issue of whether an EIS or that an EIS needs to be done. If we weren't originally contemplating that, uh, if an EIS does, is done, we have to move our schedule forward to accommodate the, the timing of, a, of an EIS process. Um, so uh, 9,500 feet long, 34 feet diameter. That's a huge tunnel. 34 feet is much bigger than a metro tunnel. If you can imagine, what is this, maybe eight feet, just 34 feet in diameter. The, the, this, the, the tunnel boring machines that build these tunnels are, 
are awe-striking when you see how uh, big they are. And if you'd like to come back and get a tour when we're actually building the one under the Anacostia, um, I'm going to be going down there and looking at it because I can't wait to see it. But um, we'd be delighted to take you all down too. Um, but so the question is, could we do enough? We've uh, a G, uh, green development in the areas that drain that otherwise would go down to this tunnel and capture it by green development on the surface. Now, there are strengths and weaknesses to both sides, which I can come back to. That's what the pilot is hopeful uh, to answer. At the moment, we couldn't do that. The consent decree does not enable it. The consent decree does not allow it. So unless there's a change to the consent decree, it's not even something that's possible. We have to build the tunnel under the current consent decree. The other tunnel is up in the Rock Creek. It's, a, it's probably the one where, just off the bat, there's most likely chance because there's the, the landscape development around here. It's much larger lots, much more green space, many more opportunities perhaps to be doing green development, and there's less to capture. So there's less quantity to capture, and there's arguably more places to do the uh, green development if you wanted to, but it's not as classic urban um, landscape design up there. This is more, more like a suburban um, landscape. So we have two different kinds of landscapes uh, that would allow us to really sample um, at a scale two different approaches. And this is a, a year later. So this is a year back even from 2015 where absent anything else we'd be starting on the facility planning to get this project done. Um, so here's uh, the notion of what uh, we're doing. Uh, this is the <laughs> an impressive performance nature of the existing project. You have what we call it the Clean Rivers Project because the long-term control plan didn't resonate with anybody with what on earth we were doing. So Clean Rivers is really why we're doing the projects. We wanted to name the project for the purpose of the effort so people would understand the cost. I, if I didn't mention the cost, it is $2.6 billion. Part of the hearing tonight with council member will be presenting our budget. It's the fastest rising part of our budget is the capital costs associated with this project and it's projected to rise every year for the next 15 years, every year, year after year after year. We've got to raise $2.6 billion to pay for this and DC Water doesn't, we raise it, but it has to be paid for by our rate payers. Um, so here the, is the level of overflow. So you can see there's three billion, more than three billion in the average hydrologic year, and you can see that's about two thirds of that is in the Anacostia. That's one of the reasons why we are going to build the tunnels in the Anacostia, um, and also the level of performance. In the average hydrologic year when we were formed, there was 82 uh, overflows, and by the time we finish with this gigantic tunnel system underneath the river, it'll be two. It's not 100%. No matter how big of a tunnel you design, there still could be a bigger storm that even will fill up the huge tunnel. And then you're still going to have to have an overflow system because rainwater is coming into a sewage system. But you can see from 82, 74, and 30, we're down to a handful of these overflows. And it's going to be the very largest of monster storms that are going to cause overflows in any year. This, this points to the advantage of the gray solution, which is in our consent decree. You can design it, you know exactly how much it captures, you know who's going to maintain it, which is us. You know where to monitor it and measure it. All the sort of the very practical operational aspects of making a, a decision on performance are highlighted in a gray infrastructure solution. So we can pretty, guarantee is overstated because this is an average hydrologic year. In a, in a year of rainfall like we've had this one where so far we've had very little snow or rainfall, you might have zero overflows in a year. If rainfall gets much heavier, uh, we'd have more. But we certainly can calculate that and know it almost to the square inch of what the performance is likely to be. That's a strength of, of the um, project. Just so you know of the work we are doing, we wanted to emphasize there are some uh, who, for whatever reasons of, of, of concern, are worried that we're trying to propose something to duck our obligations. And we want everybody to know we are ducking nothing. Currently, we are fully engaged and will deliver on the consent decree as it is required us, and we will meet our deadlines. And that's the project we were on, and we will meet it. And to give you a sense of it, this is Blue Plains. This is, this is the, the tunnel that's coming in 100 feet below grade. So this is below a metro tunnel. This is 23 feet in interior diameter. Again, think of that relative to this ceiling. It's a huge interior diameter tunnel. In a storm, the volume and velocity of the flow that's going to be coming down here is pretty impressive. So you've got to have a huge concrete retaining system so it doesn't hit and completely blow out the bottom like it would a stream itself and then shoot straight up. This 
system is a 16-story building. We are building straight down at Blue Plains. And at the bottom, there has to be a screening system to take out all the crud before it is then pumped up. And on top of this, there will be a treatment plant built that will provide additional treatment at Blue Plains. It's a, just a massive engineering project. And we are currently building this, which is why we're pouring so, one of the reasons we're pouring so much concrete on site. So we are doing this. We are not trying to shirk anything. And if, and if for whatever reason public policy suggests we don't open the consent decree, we will build this. We will satisfy and meet the obligations of that consent decree. For the consent decree itself, I won't go into great detail on this, um, but it is a consent decree entered with the federal court. The parties, D.C. Water District Government, U.S. EPA, Department of Justice, is, is, is uh, of course, negotiates for EPA as EPA's lawyer. It has a very detailed schedule for when work has to be done, concluding in 2025. That's a very significant element for our project, as I'll come back to. And it has a very specific set of remedies outlined in what we have to do and in what order. So that is what we are currently doing. And as I said, we will do. The question of what's in there currently, there is a little bit about green infrastructure. There's a $3 million pilot for us to do green infrastructure at our facilities. We are doing that. We have actually done most of it already. We'll, we'll vastly, but that's not designed to give us enough knowledge of green infrastructure to change the consent decree. It was just added into the consent decree as an element, mostly of a, of a demonstration, but we're doing it on our site. So what it's teaching us about what it would take if it's in public space or if it's a private property, no, we, it's on our facility. So we're designing and building it and putting it in place ourselves, which is a whole different ball game, as everybody knows, if we're going to engage private uh, landowners or we're going to be in the public space with DDOT and the federal government, that would be a question that would have to be addressed if we're going to do low impact development at a scale to change the big tunnel remedy. So um, we are, it, it, the, it says that on the basis of this $3 million pilot on our own facilities, we conceivably could downsize the Potomac and Rock Creek tunnels. Our, our engineering folks don't see that there's any possible way that that little project on our own facility would tell us enough about anything to propose downsizing a tunnel, given the scale of what needs to be done. So it's in there in this sense. I want to be very straight about it, but to us, this is not going to get us to a, a potential different alternative. So what we're suggesting is an adaptive management approach. And what I want everyone in the room to understand is that this is not breaking new ground. DC Water, we like to think we're in the forefront of many things. And this one, we are looking to many of our compatriots and trying to catch up, arguably. And what I've listed here are cities. We've, we have a huge notebooks back at the office where we've gone through the consent decrees of cities facing exactly the same issue who have built into their consent decree systems to allow adaptive management on the basis of much larger pilots to enable a low impact development uh, remedy. And uh, the cities are listed down the side here. Um, and uh, one of the most dramatic elements is the percentage reduction of stormwater. You can see we have uh, relative to our, our, the, the cut, we have a 96% average percentage where other cities have lower percentages. It almost, that's the biggest single challenge is that concrete gray infrastructure, we know how it works, we know what it captures, some of these other don't. The cost of ours is, uh, this is the green investment of what's being put in. Philadelphia's and New York's are actually on a different scale. They have been approved by the state agencies. In those states, the state has authority over the Clean Water Act decisions. In the district, we negotiate directly with EPA. So you may have seen some of the articles. New York just was approved by New York State. Philadelphia has been approved by Pennsylvania State environmental agencies. But EPA has not signed off on these consent decrees on either one. Because you can see the percentage reduction. They're essentially relying on green development to a much greater scale in those cities. And both cities are promoting it. I am impressed. On the other hand, the percentage capture is much less than what we are getting with the Gray Project here. And the question to us is, what is the proposal that we would put in place for a green investment? Um, what would the percentage be? What would the reductions be? And could we move forward? And, and to us, actually, before we would make this proposal, we want to have far better information about how we would do it, in what manner we would do it, all the practical details that we'd have to answer to have anywhere near the certainty of performance with a green development landscape level uh, remedy as we do with a gray development um, uh, physical plant level remedy. So uh, our proposed approach uh, is a demonstration project. Um, this would mean postponing 
but not canceling the tunnels on Rock Creek and the Potomac. It's a very significant difference from Philadelphia, for example. The Philadelphia project, which is groundbreaking and breathtaking, but it's essentially to do a mainly green development remedy, wait till the end of it, and then determine if something else is necessary and a whole nother negotiation comes in place. And it's pretty much everyone's certain that it's going to do very well, but not capture as much storm water. And the question is, what do you do when you come to that reckoning point when you still have water quality and overflows that you want to stop. And that has been delayed in the Philadelphia experiment till back end. In our case, what we've asked for is an extra series of years to do a full-scale pilot to see if the LID works. And, if, and we're going to call an advisory board together to review every bit of information, put it out on the web. None of this will be hidden. We want to be transparent about what we find. And if at the end of that pilot, we, I mean, we in the broad sense decide we'd rather have gray because we like the performance, then we will build the tunnels. So our commitment to build the tunnels doesn't change. What we've asked for is an extension of time, push back the tunnel construction so we can do a full-scale pilot, answer all these questions, and then make a decision whether an alternative should be selected when we have very hard data about how the project would be done. Um, so uh, the demonstration project, we think it's necessary. Um, and uh, without going into the details, yesterday the head of DDOT, uh, myself and the head of Department of Environment met for over an hour. And it was over practical questions that are coming up as more low impact development is being designed in the city. We're all in favor of it. But there's all sorts of issues that are coming up about how to maintain it, who's going to look after it, what if it's put in over a water main when you have trees being planted. We like the trees, but we know from experience that if you put a tree over a water main, you're going to have a problem unless you design. In one case, it was to put in low impact development, but pushed a little space next to the bollards that are put in to stop transport trucks. But that was the only place our truck could pull in to fix a water main that was right in the same space. And we had to put a halt on it. So you're stopping LID. And our reaction was, we don't mean to stop anything. We're now having the kinds of discussions on a design basis that we haven't had to have before because we haven't, weren't doing as much low impact development. We've got to get these answers as best we can right. But the kind of questions that I'm also asking, and this is from the perspective of a very operational agency, is after these low impact development uh, installations are built, who maintains them? Where do the trucks come from? Where do the trucks get placed? I mean, one of the big issues we have in, our, in the city, we have about 550 vehicles in our fleet, is where to put them. Because DC would like to move us off where we are now, which is perfectly fine as long as we can figure out somewhere else to put them. It's practical questions of who drives the trucks, where do they get paid from, where does the training come from. We're all we'd like to have as much knowledge and answers to those questions. Not that it has to be perfect, as we can before we would agree to go with the green development <coughs> alternative, because we're the ones on the hook. It's our consent decree. We think all of these uh, answers have to be uh, questions have to be answered to the best of our ability. So these are the two areas um, that we're looking at, drainage to the Georgetown and drainage to um, the uh, Rock Creek, uh, low uh, density residential. This is historic, which is its own challenge in Georgetown, as well as heavily developed. And what we've done is actually looked in great detail. Um, and I'm not patting myself on the back. This is a, a decision the board has supported. But we've now spent more than a million and a half dollars in prep work to do the work to produce the proposal to do this option. So that's on top of it. This is not, this is a million and a half we've put into it because we have gone in and looked at parcels throughout these areas and we've done a fairly complex matrix of where we would select to do the pilot. We don't want to self-select land that would be easy to do. So what is representative of the actual land cover? We're going to do those places so we don't select something where it's easier for us to make the project work, but then we don't really learn what we need to learn to make it work. We want different income levels. We want different wards, different political situations, commercial. We, we had this complex ratio matrix of trying to select places that will truly tell us what we need to do to then model it to scale to see what we could um, ultimately do. So this is the concept plan approach of where we've been going down. We've walked these neighborhoods. We're starting to map the neighborhoods. If we invested, what could we do and at what scale? Um, the last time we discussed this with Harriet, she had all sorts of ideas about the performance of any one L ideas at a certain level. But if you combine them together, it's like the, the sum is stronger than the pieces, that you'd get better <coughs> performance doing it as a whole. We're trying to model all that, but then actually build it somewhere, monitor it, see what the performance is. Um, 
so uh, you know, and, and this is this is old hat to you. You know exactly the kinds of things we're talking about. Uh, this organization is in very supportive and in the lead on these sorts of things. Um, so the institutional issues, what I asked our engineers to do is create a Gantt chart just like they would if this were a hard project with everything laid out in, in time about, and there's 10 institutional papers that we think need to be written, and these are not philosophical papers. This is what are the permits needed and who grants them and in what order and what are, who are the agencies that need to be involved. Very practical. Each one, we have a paper. We have it assigned to a time frame, when it's going to be answered, how it's going to be done. So it's not just physically installing a green roof. It's all sorts of institutional issues, financial questions. If it's a private property owner who does it, what happens if they change over to a new private property owner and how do we make sure that the new private property owner does what the past one was if we're counting that performance in our remedy. Now, a lot of questions to answer. Um, so what we have proposed EPA, we wrote a letter actually to the administrator, Lisa Jackson, um, last uh, summer. We followed up with a letter to Region 3, which is in Philadelphia, which is the region that has oversight for the district. Um, we have proposed to spend, on top of what we've already spent in the planning phase of this, between 10 and $30 million for the pilot itself. I'd have to guess it's going to end up closer to 30 than 10, but that's what we've uh, been saying. Um, a large of this is going to take, we've, we've actually spoken to environmental groups. I'm actually going to the DC Environmental Network in May. Uh, we're going across the city. We have gotten support from the mayor, from uh, Congresswoman um, uh, Norton. Um, so uh, the question is, we think that doing this at a pilot level will advance the state of the art, will be benefit to the city no matter what, even if at the end of it, we, again, the broad we, decided it was a great pilot, you really demonstrated a lot, we learned a lot, but the capture ratios are just not high enough, and we'd rather go with the gray infrastructure. We're ready to build it, so we would. I'm hopeful that we, in fact, find a green infrastructure, one that works. I, otherwise, I wouldn't be here. But if not, we'll build the gray. We're not walking away from it. But we certainly will have, at, at nothing else, put 30 million, 10 to $30 million into green infrastructure, which is permanent. That doesn't go away. And we've gotten, we hope, all this learning um, uh, about how it would be done at scale if we so chose. This is that Gantt chart, uh, a short version of it. The long version is much bigger because it has all the little pieces built into it. Um, what we've asked for from EPA, and this may seem like a long time to you, but I want to come back to that, is an eight-year extension of time in order to do the project, the papers, the evaluation, performance, maintenance, and then a calculation of alternatives for what it could be that is not green versus gray. It is grays in there now would be some hybrid, perhaps even some gray infrastructure that currently we're not thinking about, but would become relevant if the amount of capture we had to, to accomplish with gray was reduced. So we don't have to do a huge tunnel, but if we do this all other alternative gray solution. Um, and the, the notion of the eight years, EPA is, is as, as others, have, why, why eight years? Why That seems like a lot of years to do a pilot. The consent decrees in other cities that have this adaptive management technique are all 25 years because they realize the period of time to do a pilot that's meaningful and then the decision making time, even if after the pilot's done, we then have to produce alternatives. Our experience is, is that it actually takes a fairly long time, sometimes a couple of years, just for the various government agencies to come to a conclusion about what the right choice is. But there, there's 25 years to do the adaptive management technique. Our consent decree is only a 20 year consent decree, so we had five years to start with, and we're seven years in. So we actually only have 13, 14 years left to do the bulk of the work of the consent decree, because the first big chunk was planning and gearing up. We are now full tilt pretty much from now till the end. So in order for us to be able to hold back on what we need to do to get those two other tunnels built and have the time to do a sufficient, uh, meaningful pilot, we believe is eight years. That's a negotiable point as far as we're concerned, but we, are, we have gone to EPA and explained to them exactly where these dates come from and why we think that's a, a fair a number and very similar to what has been granted to other cities um, in similar circumstance. Um, so we know that per issues, permitting construction, post-construction monitoring, all that is built into the plan. Um, these are the years uh, that we've asked for. Uh, institutional issues, this is actually where I think the perhaps the most work is going to need to be done is how to make all these decisions and who's going to be on the hook. Construction, post-construction monitoring, four full years. Um, it's 11 years, but 2012, we weren't planning to start till for three years back, which is why 11 
minus 3 gets us back to 8. So that's where the 8 came from. But we won't wait to start till 2015. We'll start immediate. Well, we already have. As I said, we have about a million and a half um, into the project so far. Um, so uh, we think this is absolutely in the public interest. Um, uh, there is a lot going on in the city already. We do not mean to suggest there isn't a lot of, of interest in this, including from here. Um, but uh, the, the kind of firepower that we're going to deploy, I think, will add to that. Uh, we're going to bring our entire engineering uh, squad um, to the forefront on this and try to answer it like our engineers answer everything, very operationally, very systematically, and, and have a very specific answer to every question uh, connected with budgets and maintenance and uh, how, over time, what about 10 years from now, what about 20 years from now? With a tunnel, we know what we're doing 20 years from now. We need to know, or know as best as we can what we would do with this remedy. 20 years in from now. Um, so we think there's tremendous public interest. So our next uh, step, we have sought lots of uh, support from a lot of different avenues. Uh, we understand that this is not typical for you to take action on an informational presentation, but uh, we hope that you'll at least consider um, uh, if and we're certainly willing to answer any questions, which I can do now. Uh, we have uh, EPA. We actually got an answer back from EPA yesterday. Uh, I'm afraid to say that it was tepid at best. Um, and so we definitely have some work to do uh, with EPA, our experience. And I used to be an EPA enforcement lawyer. Can't believe some of the decisions I made back then. Um, but uh, uh, I know what that mindset is, having been there. And they have a deal in place to sort of why, why open something. And our reaction is because there's all sorts of good reasons to open it. And, and persuading EPA to do that is, is uh, a challenge. But we're on it, and we're working on it. Uh, we have, as I said, uh, Mayor Gray has written a letter of support. We've gotten a letter uh, from the Congresswoman, a variety of organizations, environmental groups, individuals have signed on. Um, and uh, one of the key points I also want to mention that's been very significant in some audiences is one of the distinct differences between gray and green, aside from the green infrastructure and the energy and uh, heat island effect and habitat, all sorts of uh, benefits at the landscape level, is the job difference. The job creation in a deep tunnel project is significant, but there's very specialized folks who do that work, and most of them come in. They do tunneling work all over the world, actually, and they come in and they run these giant machines. The kind of work that would be associated with landscape changes, doing more green alleys, green streets, green roofs, uh, bioswales, is the kind of work that we think is likely to put a lot of people in the district uh, to work. Uh, which is probably a great public benefit. Some, of, Many of them might be folks who don't have jobs now. And to think of the cost difference between supporting someone who's in trouble to someone who has got a good productive job over time. It's not a job that comes and goes. You have to then maintain it. And I personally believe that one of the parts of this is going to have to be a maintenance trust fund where we would fund, and I'm saying this as a personal opinion, DC Water has not agreed to this, we don't, I'm just assuming it has to be part of it, is that we put aside a sizable amount of money in a permanent fund that could not be used for anything other than every year having a certain source of funds to maintain these uh, uh, low impact development applications and of course drive the jobs that are associated with it. So we think that is a, a benefit. Our, our, our direct need is to achieve environmental results because we are on the consent decree. We're the ones who have a, a set of uh, performance standards to reach. But there are all sorts of other benefits that come to the city if this other approach uh, turns out to work. So um, I hope that wasn't too long. I thank you for uh, listening. Um, I know there's great interest by this organization for these topics, so I was delighted to have the chance. Uh, I'm actually here with Alan Heyman and Will Pickering uh, from our staff. Some of you may know. Um, so we can jointly follow up today or in the future with any questions you have as we go forward. Thank you, George. Uh, uh, a couple of questions, um, and you answered many questions I jotted down. Um, while you can't speak for EPA, um, and I know you just got that tepid response yesterday, but I was going to ask you if you could generally characterize uh, kind of the nature of the discussions and perhaps, uh, I think I know the answer, um, how enthusiastically they've embraced this possibility. And along with that, while DOJ assists EPA in the negotiations, is DOJ a separate signatory to the CO as well as EPA? Um, to start in the second part of the question, yeah. I believe my memory is that they did sign the consent decree, yeah. but I'd have to go back and check to be sure. They certainly come to all the negotiations. Right, right. Um, my view is that, is that 
the Department of Justice is the is the lawyer for the client, and the yeah. client should be making the decision on the policy. But the um, Department of Justice has strong opinions on these things, um, and uh, they've been very hesitant at the staff level uh, in our negotiations. Uh, to go to the first part of your question, um, it's well, there's clear precedent that they've made these decisions before. Yes, absolutely. What might be which we have we have been highlighting um, the the challenge from EPA of, of answering the question of how, what is EPA's sort of demeanor towards this proposal is it almost entirely depends on who you ask. If you're here in Washington, the headquarters office is promoting these ideas as the direction of the agency. And so they have new policies that have come out on green development. They have new policies on integrated permitting. There's all sorts of policy level work there's, that are coming out that encouraged us. One of the reasons that we're encouraged to, to try this. Um, the regional office and the enforcement staff who you end up negotiating with on an operational level, they're aware of those policies, I guess, but that's not what's before them on a day-to-day -day basis. And my, rather than what you hear from headquarters, which is encouragement, this is where we want the agency to go, this is, and I, I know Lisa Jackson from New Jersey personally, and we've talked about it, which is, this is great. Let's, not that we agree with it, but we encourage you, go for it. Um, it's very different from the response from the region, which which uh, is cautious, uh, to put it mildly. Has Mr. Garvin been encouraging or uh, cautious? He, we, I've only gone to him once. I've, uh, we, we're uh, having been in with the agencies before. I know many of us are. I, I'm always hesitant to go above the operate until we've done the formal steps and then yeah, right. to elevate, which haven't really done yet, other than folks in headquarters do know that we're doing this project. It's Washington, D.C., or at least proposing this project. Um, but I, th I think Mr. Garvin is interested. Everyone seems interested, but when you get down to the nitty gritty, essentially what EPA is telling us is, as long as you agree to meet exactly the same level of performance that you would have with the tunnels, which I'm not sure is gonna be possible. There may have to be a trade-off. We'll accept a little bit less capture. However, we'll get all these other things. And the, can you sort of evaluate and choose a different package of benefits than the capture rate that the tunnel uh, achieved so successfully. I'm not prejudging that decision. I just would like the chance to make the case, and then the decision will go where it goes. EPA wants to presuppose that decision, which is we're not even going to negotiate capture rates. If you can do 95% or 96%, we don't care what remedy you use as long as you re reach the number. Um, and then separate from that, essentially they want us to do all the prep work, all the analysis work, all the planning work, all this money we're putting into it already before they agree to give us any flexibility which my board is questioning me on. Hawkins, why are you asking for these significant funds and you haven't gotten anything yet? You're essentially negotiating with yourself. Um, so, uh, but they haven't said no. They have said, yes, let's continue talking, let's continue negotiating. So the door is open. We have done the steps we need to do at a staff level, which we think is always the right way to start. And I do think this is, the reason that I am not feeling badly about elevating the issue is I do think it's not, it's a policy question. Does EPA, as a policy matter, want to go in this direction or not? And that is a decision that's made at the upper levels and then reflected in this kind of action, rather than uh, a, a person who's negotiated consent decrees in Region 3 has never agreed to one like this before. There hasn't been something like this in Region 3. Um, Region 3 has not agreed, for example, and signed on to the Philadelphia consent decree. Um, although ours would be a completely different ballgame. I hope that wasn't too long-winded no, to your Another question, question. then I'll, my last question, I think. From sure. A, from a project construction budget perspective, if you roll the dice on this and you get a bad roll and it just doesn't work, performance evaluation isn't there, you've put off the, while well, you're still going to be continuing with the design of the tunnel, but you ultimately have to build it, pushing it off. Any estimate as to what the, anticipated construction cost or the rate of increase would be and which will add even more to the to the 2.6 our sense is that uh it goes both ways will we defer some costs mm -hmm. which in fact you have the time value of money and we add mm -hmm. some costs with pushing them back farther in time and as best we can tell on an econometric basis other than the 1.5 million so far that we put in the 30 million which would just have been spent that we think it's about a wash for us, that this is not something we're doing to make money if we ended up building the tunnels or lose money. We think we'd be about it. There's some financial benefit to deferring 
the project for these years, uh, and there's some financial detriment to building it. And at least at the moment, we're doing more economic analysis of that now. We've held off on doing thorough analysis because we really want to have a sense of how many years we're talking about because that's the biggest denominator for changing the calculation of, of how much time we would actually have. And, and then one more question. The, the $2.6 billion is a hefty figure that ultimately the ratepayers pay. Mm -hmm. The business community is behind this as a, you know, potential way to keep that number down and have you specifically talk to the federal city council and they, they take up initiatives like this and get behind them have they we've gotten a letter of support just last week from aoba the uh, mm -hmm. apartment and office building association uh, I, i'm scheduled to go in front of the dcbia to talk mm -hmm. about this although the comments have been very positive uh, similar from the chamber we haven't actually got letters from them yet but all of what we're hearing is okay. positive uh, the universities in the city are are very supportive of of the idea um, the business community likes it i my impression is for several reasons one is it might reduce the costs but even if it were the same price we would i think there would have to be some incentive program to encourage low impact development on private property because we're just not going to be able to capture enough unless we do it and a lot of these developers or existing landowners want an incentive program that they could access to to get funds to do something that their customers like and they'd like to do anyways so uh, we think that the development and business community is very interested in, in this alternative thank you other questions for mr hawkins uh, mr Well, it's as a comment i guess um i mean i don't know that you know, personally, I feel like we can't be sort of forceful enough in supporting this idea. I mean, there might have been a time in, in this country when we could spend a dollar and get only a dollar's worth of benefits, in this case, uh, you know, water quality. But if we're talking about spending a dollar and, and, and not only getting water quality benefits, but getting, uh, you know, cooling the city, you know, by greening it, which is going to re literally reduce the temperature, reduce our energy use, reduce our, our carbon emissions reduce the cost to our citizens, um, you know, beautify the city, create habitat, employ people, not just to design and install, but to maintain. I just think when you put the numbers together, and that's what I'm most interested in seeing, I just don't see how it, 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 it wouldn't be a tremendously compelling case, and I'm not even sure if the net environmental benefit, even at a lower level of certainty, something in the 80s, like what every other city in America has negotiated, that, that you, but because of the other environmental benefits that you'd see, that you wouldn't end up having a net case. You and I, having both worked for EPA in the past, know that the hardest thing is for, that, is for the environmental agencies to compare benefits across their own program areas. But I, I do think, you know, this is so much more sensible for the city in every way um, that, uh, that I, I hope our, our, our colleagues would be willing to support it here. The, the other thing I would just point out is that we have nearly 8,000 acres of roads in Washington, and so I don't see how this is going to work unless, unless uh, you know, roadways are a serious part of the solution. And I know you've been meeting with DDOT. Uh, but it seems like, you know, one of the research projects we need to do together is really put out a call for a road design, for a road construction method that will actually store, collect and store stormwater before infiltrating it into the subsurface, into the ground. That, that I, don't, I don't see how we can do it without, uh, without the, engaging the roadways. Um, thank you for the first comment, which I personally wholeheartedly agree, which is... Um, Thankfully, a position our board has also taken to date. On the second question, I can tell you that DDOT is very enthusiastic about this. The irony is, is that if we did this, I also agree we will never capture enough unless we get to roadways. We could end up being one of the largest funders of DDOT projects in the city, would be DC Water, which would allow them to take money that they would have spent in the districts where we're funding it for water quality and spend that transportation money somewhere else. So the whole city's boat would be rising because they would they would take their funds, spend it elsewhere. We Georgetown and and parts of Rock Creek, we'd essentially cover every road project there is. We'd cover the cost because we do it to capture rainwater. So yes, you are right. Uh, I think that is. And at least so far, the Department of Transportation is very interested in, in pursuing. We did get a proposal coming through the Anacostia Watershed Society uh, from Clark um, uh, about 
specifically roadways and how they could capture water. And their view, this was in writing, and this is what our engineers want to test. Our engineers are the ultimate show me folks. And it sounds great on paper, let's go build it and see if it works. But their view is you can do a square foot per road capture of understory at a quantity that's you have a very specific number, 0 0.08 gallons per water, and if you multiply it by enough roadways, you can know exactly how much water you're capturing. And their view is they could capture more water than our tunnels if we were willing to rebuild enough roads, which their view is cost less than building a tunnel 100 feet underground with a drill machine the size of a football field. Um, we, uh, I'm encouraged by that hugely, and I'd love to test it out, which is why we want to do this pilot. Uh, Mr. May. Um, first of all, let me just say the uh, Park, Service, Park Service is very supportive of, of this effort overall for reasons that are obvious and I don't need to restate. Um, the, uh, um, and I think for the benefit of the Commission, I think we need to understand a little bit more about the item of the EIS that's necessary for the Georgetown waterfront. And, and we haven't even started talking about what the potential impacts are at the, for the Rock Creek Tunnel. Um, but this this commission has taken action in the past to approve what's being done, what's just getting started at um, CSO 19 along the Anacostia River in the vicinity of RFK Stadium. And for that one, we did an environmental assessment that addressed all of the permitting issues having to do with the Anacostia Tunnel. Well, we had the convenience there of dealing with land um, that is um, adjacent to the, the uh, stadium parking lots and could be taken up for this construction project for a long period of time without having a uh, significant impact on the environment. So we were able to sign a, a finding to that effect. When we talk about doing something like that at this roughly the same scale on the Georgetown waterfront, and recall that this commission approved the Georgetown waterfront park, which was um, now is, is a, a, a tremendous asset for the city and was a joint effort of the, the city and the Park Service to produce in terms of the land and the funding and everything else. Um, imagine a portion of that being torn up for a, uh, a project like this, plus uh, additional areas uh, beyond this, uh, beyond the area of Georgetown Waterfront Park itself, further upriver um, being taken up F and, and consumed for a period of several years while a similar drop shaft is built and connecting tunnels. And we're not just talking about, you know, just beyond Georgetown Waterfront Park. We're talking about impacts that go um, several hundred yards, as I recall, um, up the Capitol Crescent Trail. And so that means essentially building a roadway sufficient to support all of these same trucks going up and down that portion of what is now a, a tremendous resource and a bicycle and hiking trail. So it's got the potential to have huge, huge impacts, which is why we believe at this point an EIS is necessary. And when we go into the mode of having it to do an, an EIS, we're, n we're not just talking about, and we're talking about additional time, which it means moving the schedule forward. Um, it also means um, an uncertainty about the timing overall. So even if you move it forward a year or two, that may not be enough time to bring it all the way to a conclusion. And then last thing is we don't know exactly what that conclusion will be. And we may come to the end of that conclusion and determine that, you know, the decision that we can make isn't fully supportive of what DC Water needs to do to meet their dis consent decree. So there's, uh, I think, an absolute necessity for this project to be undertaken, and I think this commission should support it to the strongest extent possible. So. Uh, thank you, Peter. The only comment I make about that is what I had not done, which you just did, is not, I didn't discuss at all that there are serious impacts from the current remedy and its construction process, which you, I love the Crescent Trail and that new park, I, I'm there a lot. And we're not doing it on purpose. We'd rather not have to put huge trucks and everything else, but when you're pouring, 1,200 cubic yards of concrete to get one of these gigantic shafts down. And in, in, in the Potomac side, it's a deeper, I mean, it's a, uh, the diameter of the shaft is larger than the one on the Anacostia. It's gonna be a massive construction project. <laughs> and there will be a toll um, in the short run and the longer term for the current remedy, let alone what it might be an alternative, which is a reason maybe the EIS starts and we push back the dates to do the pilot, and the EIS comes to some alternatives, and the pilot's showing alternatives that those two 
work in parallel and support each other. And if, in fact, the alternative doesn't work, the EIS has come to a conclusion that there's, you come to some um, points at the same time, that makes a lot of sense to me. So, Additional comments? Mr. Dennis. Is your board united on this program? Yes, the board is uh, united in the pilot, yes. So that would include not only D.C., but uh, Montgomery, Prince George's, and Fairfax as well? Correct. Um, the, as a matter of pricing, just so you understand, we have a very complicated through the IMA, which some of you may know a whole lot about, which uh, has been approved by almost every jurisdiction. I have one of the original copies. You do. Yeah. Uh, well, there's about, a, there's about to be a new uh, 2012 IMA. It's actually waiting for the district council uh, to review and authorize the mayor to sign. Um, but we allocate costs between the jurisdictions. Uh, Blue Plains is one of the original regional resource. Uh, it's the only wastewater facility that has an area that covers multiple states that doesn't happen anywhere else in the country. But um, we allocate costs very specifically. The cost of the tunnels, 92.9% of the cost of the tunnels are allocated to the district ratepayers, and 7.1% are allocated to the suburban which is, and that was a calculation, actually Dan Tangerlini um, was the one on the board who was in charge when that um, allocation was made, which is now going to be in the new IMA. But that 7.1%, 2.6 billion is still not a small number. Um, but yes, every jurisdiction on the board, Prince George's, we have the CAOs of Prince George, uh, Fairfax, Montgomery, Loudoun and Arlington indirectly are all supportive of seeking this approach. Others, Mr. Provencher. Are Mr. Hawk, uh, Hawkins slides available to us? Or are those close hold? Are they publicly available so we can? I believe I'm, they're publicly available, and we'd be happy to share them with the commission. Um, we had a small uh, uh, tunneling project at our facility, less less than a mile. One of the things that we did was we found that we had uh, optimal soil conditions, so that we could use the piping as the drill bit, basically. Uh, do we know uh, anything about the soil conditions along the routes of these proposed tunnels to see if um, certainly a similar approach what, is favorable? Uh, I love this job, and I'm a lawyer running D, uh, uh, D.C. Water, so I'm fascinated by the engineering uh, lessons that I learned just going mm -hmm. through the job every day. In order to prepare for the tunnel, mm -hmm. the biggest concern that we have as far as an unexpected cost is underground conditions that we haven't allocated, sure. ha right. planned for. Because if we hit a subsurface that we haven't planned for, we'll have the wrong drill bit, right. and you can have conditions. enormous cost overruns. So right. we've actually done, we spent, I can't remember the number, but it's an astronomical amount of money and, it, and many of you have been driving on 295 have been seeing these drill borings going on. Mm -hmm. That's us. We've been, mm -hmm. We have done every 200 feet all the way along to drill mm -hmm. down Good. and figure out exactly what's there. Mm -hmm. The way this big machine works is that the front cuts the hole and it se essentially is laying tracks going back right. so that there's a conveyor system taking the rubble back while mm -hmm. new pieces of pipe are being right. brought forward at the same time in what's a small city. They're laid into the side of this tunnel as the machine is going along with the HVAC and the hydraulics, mm -hmm. everything being put in. So it's this moving construction system, which I haven't actually seen one. I've only seen the descriptions and the animation we have, but it sounds breathtaking. Short answer is we've done as much as, and actually perhaps even more. We're very nervous about hitting conditions that we're not mm -hmm. prepared for, because that would be a cost issue. So we've done very, very detailed borings the entire length. We haven't started over in Potomac or Rock Creek yet doing borings, but we have done it for the entire length. Um, Type of uh, piping, uh, another lesson learned was when we went to fiberglass reinforced pipe, it lowered the coefficient of friction and allowed us to shrink the diameter of the piping. Is that being considered? I don't know the answer to that question. I can find out. I know there, that um, we have uh, a lot of engineering firms, there it's a design build uh, engineering contract. Mm -hmm. but I do not know the specific answer, but I can find out. Okay. I, we're certainly interested in any of those kinds of solutions that could save money uh, or make the project more efficient. We're very impressed with the level of analysis that's been done today. I was surprised, uh, just to clarify, did, were you not able to calculate, for example, throw out a number, for every 10 million gallons of overflow that is captured, it will reduce the diameter of the pipe by a foot? No, no calculations like that have been done at this point? Um, I'm sure we have done calculations like that because uh, actually the, one of the last times I was here was the calculations we were doing about using a tunnel underneath the mall 
to capture, where there was very specific calculations of how much you'd have to do to capture a certain percentage of rainwater from the flood, uh, what was it, 2006? Um, and I just don't remember what the numbers are here. What we're, what we're realizing, however, is, well, we know that end of X, sort of a math equation of how much volume versus the size of the pipe. It's the calculation of how much roadway, it's, it's working back up, upstream, as it were, to how much landscape you have to manage to capture that much, um, which is what is, is we really want to get the answer to. Uh, last point, perhaps sure. council can help us with uh, the difficult decision of it. It looks like there's strong support. However, this is an informational presentation. If there's some way that we can endorse, for the record, an informational presentation, that would be welcome. Uh, welcome guidance. Yeah, uh, I think this would probably require a, a motion, uh, generally along the lines of uh, I just jotted something down. Uh, we're generally supportive of DC Water's green infrastructure. Uh, pilot project initiative to determine whether LID could be a practical alternative to a more expensive tunnel uh, construction project or something along those lines. Um, if, uh, if there would be a motion and a presumed second, what I would uh, ask is that uh, since the executive committee has uh, both district representative and federal representatives on it, we sort of cover the waterfront, that maybe the executive committee could take a crack at uh, drafting the letter and then we could when it's near full completion we will share second. so uh it's been moved and seconded with that understanding all in favor say aye, aye. opposed no thank you we'll be in touch uh, mr hawkins we are most grateful thank, thank you. you for your very comprehensive uh, presentation thank you. we have one more item before us and that's agenda item 6c it's the intelligence community campus bethesda phase one north campus uh, we have Mr. Hinkle. Yes, thank you, Mr. Uh, Chairman and the Commission. And I think we'll continue the discussion on stormwater management with this uh, next presentation. But if you remember um, last February, the Commission approved a new master plan for the Intelligence Community Campus in Bethesda, Maryland. And within this approval, the Commission requested that the applicant uh, set targets related to deforestation and stormwater management and its design of phase one of the installation. So the Army Corps is the Army Corps of Engineers is here today to discuss with the Commission their progress towards these goals um, in advance of actually completing the design of Phase 1 and submitting these plans for Commission review. So with that, I'd like to uh, introduce Mr. Jared Olson with the Corps, and he has a short presentation for the Commission to explain this progress. Um, with that, I'll hand it over. Thank you, Jeff, and thank you to the Commission for the invitation today. Uh, Moving on to uh, what was the outcome from the two February meeting, we basically had two categories of actions. Uh, one was uh, a set of comments that needed to be addressed relative to the master plan, uh, which we have provided a coordinating draft to the staff here and are working through that process of finalizing those documents to incorporate all the uh, comments that were made. And then we had the discussion with regard to the targets that were provided relative to the deforestation on the site and the stormwater management question and what I would like to do is spend most of my time today discussing uh, those two particular issues because they are, in fact, uh, the most challenging. And I'd like to highlight the, the progress we have been making to date. Just to reorient everyone to the site, just a quick refresher, this is the former NGA campus in Bethesda. Uh, Red Line is the property boundary. Sangamore Road is located here, MacArthur Boulevard, the Wapakoneta, which is the private road uh, with the residential development here and then the Potomac River to the west. Phase one, uh, two phases for the uh, redevelopment of the site uh, includes uh, this general area. The main features are the parking garage, the vehicle control, visitor control, and the access road. Uh, phase two includes uh, demolition of some select structures, new construction of a new connector building, and then renovation of three existing buildings that will remain. Uh, the retention of this uh, historical uh, area here known as the ellipse and then general greening of the site uh, throughout the, uh, the rest of the uh, uh, site. Uh, just to uh, recap on the progress made to date uh, with respect to the question of uh, deforestation with respect uh, relative to the uh, location of the parking garage. 
Our original design submission called for uh, three acres of, of clearing associated with a garage. It was generally located or oriented with an access north-south on the western edge of the site. Again, Sangamore Road being down here. This slide was presented as a part of the staff uh, briefing on 2 February, and it did indicate the progress that was made to reducing it 70% to a less than one acre of disturbance. And I'm going to zoom in on this slide for the next and discuss the specific details. Uh, the key uh, improvements that we made uh, going into the 2 February commission meeting uh, were reducing the size of the garage from uh, 2240 spaces to 1800 spaces. Uh, this enabled us to uh, retain uh, more of the forested area located here, as well as all of the specimen trees that have been identified as a part of our survey. Uh, the question with regard to view shed impact, we were able to lower the elevation in the garage on the site and so as to minimize the view shed impacts off-site into the Potomac River Gorge, as well as to the neighborhoods uh, surrounding the um, uh, facility. Uh, we do have a requirement to maintain an open garage. In order to do that, we have incorporated this feature. Uh, it's known as the reverse slope berm, where basically we're lowering it down and you come out of the lowest level of the garage up to a ridge, if you will, that surrounds on the west and the southern edge of the garage. And uh, that provides not only uh, a view block uh, from the immediate neighbors here along Wapakoneta and from views along MacArthur Boulevard, uh, but it also allows for some plantings that will be planned uh, for the, the top of the reverse slope berm that further screens the view of the garage. And in combination with the green screen that is planned for the top of the garage structure, that will uh, very much uh, mitigate the, uh, the view shed impacts. Our progress since 2 February, we've uh, been able to go from approximately four or 0.75 acres of deforestation, potential deforestation to 0.45 acres. We did that principally by sliding the garage or translating it along its long axis here, approximately north, northeast. North is generally to the right of the slide. We are able to further then develop our design with regard to the reverse slope berm, which previously had only been uh, designed to a level of a rough concept, and have been able to reduce principally three-tenths of an acre of potential deforestation along here, which is now shown in the screen. The yellow does represent areas of potential deforestation that remain as part of the development for the parking garage. And the um, uh, feature that's located right here with this uh, jut out is actually a requirement from MDE. It is the stormwater outfall. And I will talk uh, more about stormwater, uh, the plan for that, because that is the second topic. But generally speaking, we've sized and located the facility such that uh, we have uh, made the best use of the available space on this site in order to locate the garage and have pretty much uh, snugged it in as best as we can, still maintaining features of the open garage, the nece necessity for two lanes in and two lanes out of traffic up on the third level, the two lanes and two lanes, uh, one lane in, one lane out on the second level, basically all the parameters we have, as well as the standoffs from the de denial barriers, which we were uh, had addressed previously. Along uh, with the uh, uh, planning here that's been done, we've continued our public engagement. Uh, I've continued to meet with community leaders as well as uh, other stakeholders from the National Park Service, Montgomery County as well, and uh, continue to uh, provide them with the, the current status of where we're at. Uh, later this month, we will actually stake out the limit of disturbance, which is the line that borders the yellow area here on site and uh, invite select members to come in uh, from the community to come in and view what the actual area is because we're really dealing with kind of a paper representation of what our plan is here but it is uh, the state of the design thus far. I'm going to transition to the stormwater and talk a little bit about that. The requirement that we had was uh, to uh, treat and retain 100 percent of a 25-year storm. Uh, the, this, the judge the magnitude of that for this area, 5.8 inches of rain over 25, uh, excuse me, 24 hour period represents a 25 year storm. Uh, that volume of water 
uh, basically the 4.6 million gallons of, across the whole site uh, would fill basically a football field uh, 11 feet deep. So if you can kind of get a feel for the quantity of water that we're talking about here, it, it is significant. If we were just talking about the impact or the water across uh, the north campus, we'd be looking at an area the size of a football field um, approximately four feet deep. A key distinction from an engineering perspective versus on the topics of or the, the terms retain versus detain. Uh, retain, uh, we believe, or it means to us basically that you do not release the stormwater for the site. It either infiltrates, evaporates, or is reused on the site. Detention, on the other hand, is collected and there's a controlled release. And what we're going to show you is how we are basically moving from that point forward to address and go beyond the minimum uh, requirements from MDE with regard to the stormwater management. Just to kind of go back to the uh, site design or the site layout again for a moment, just the, the area is pretty congested. To recall that Sangamore is actually the high side of the site. The ground slopes generally away toward the Potomac River here. Uh, from a gravity collection perspective for stormwater, we basically have the two areas that we've identified and are using for collecting stormwater that are located on in these particular areas of the site. Again, not wanting to disturb any of the forest uh, that remains in this area. With that, uh, we want to make sure that we uh, locate those structures such that we make the best use of the available space, but challenges that we have with locating a stormwater management structure elsewhere on the site, generally having to avoid the ellipse here because of its historical nature, are the um, issues of utilities, for one, that are located throughout the site that complicate that effort, and second, the um, necessity we would have of collecting stormwater here and then basically pumping it back up about 20 feet in elevation to store it here temporarily. Uh, the other factor or fact with regard to this site is it does not perk very well. In other words, it does not meet the uh, criteria, minimum criteria for water infiltration into the ground. So that this, given those constraints, uh, we are pretty limited in what we think we can do with regard to the stormwater management and retaining it. However, the detention, I think, is definitely an achievable objective, and that is the direction which we're heading. And really, if you go to what the principles that MDE and uh, ESA are uh, uh, requiring is that we want to return the site to the pre-development uh, hydrology to the maximum extent practical. And we recognize that this idea of no adverse downstream effects, particularly in the parkland, and uh, that, uh, that are immediately the bluffs and the canal and then the Potomac River is uh, really what our true objective is. So we believe that the solution that we will have uh, going forward from here will achieve that objective. A quick comment on standards with respect to uh, uh, this site. Uh, the MDE did issue a stormwater and erosion sediment control permit in January 2012. Now that was based on the preliminary design that was submitted last summer um, that showed the three acres of clearing and the larger garage. We did, they did issue it with the caveat after we informed them that we weren't going to develop the site exactly in that manner and that we were making efforts to reduce the deforestation on the site and shrink the garage. They did issue the permit, but it was caveated that we could not go forward with any ground disturbing activities until we resolved this issue of, of the garage location and the approval of the master plan, which we were able to do in February. We have since uh, submitted a revised uh, permit application and that is currently under review with the uh, MDE. For redevelopment, MDE examines basically two aspects of uh, w affecting water quality. One is the amount of impervious surface that remains on the site and it is uh, desirable to uh, reduce that to the maximum extent practical. If you can reduce it by at least 50%, you really don't have to pursue any water treatment options on site. Um, but given that's the other uh, option, what we have found ourselves in is we're not quite able to get to a 50% elimination of impervious surface on the site. And so we will combine, use both the uh, impervious area reduction as well as the uh, treatment of water prior to discharge. 
And the last point, just to highlight there, is that uh, the MD looks for us to treat the first flush, if you will, the first flush on impervious surfaces that will pick up those contaminants, uh, oil spills from vehicles that park in parking areas, anything that might spill off a vehicle on a road surface. Uh, and the key is to treat that uh, first flush of water in order to uh, meet uh, basic water quality standards. This chart really focuses in on two things, the impervious surface area reduction that we're achieving uh, given for, compared to the existing conditions that we have, as well as the efforts of going above and beyond with regard to water treatment uh, for the site that we're able to achieve by the way we size uh, the structures that we have. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about both of those in a little more detail, but real quick, Presently, we have 8.2 acres of impervious service on the site. Uh, we have an approved permit that was approved in January uh, in which we achieved a 35% reduction in impervious surface. Uh, we have further uh, developed that design so that we will achieve an overall 47% reduction of impervious surface on the site from the 8.2 acres to the 4.3 acres. With respect to treatment, stormwater treatment, there was treatment for four acres of surface, impervious surface area on the site. And we had a, received the permit for uh, the treatment originally collecting just from the parking garage. Now what we have added in the current design is gone beyond just the parking garage is kind of the minimum standard, but we've also incorporated all the roadways, uh, access roads into the site. And we do have the ability to collect the water from all of the pervious surfaces as well within the limit of disturbance within the North Campus. So basically what we're doing is collecting 100% of the stormwater runoff and treating the first inch of that uh, per the MDE standard. Conceptually, this shows what the approved permit design was for. Again, it collected uh, water primarily from the parking garage and went to an oil grit separator located here off of the northern end of the garage and discharged into the stream immediately to the west. The road surface that came down was also a requirement and that went into a biofilter structure here, which was collected, treated, and discharged to a stream that flows to the west from the mid-site. In the current design and where we're going again is 100% treatment from the, the whole area. So clearly this will exceed uh, the minimum requirements uh, stipulated uh, or the basic requirements uh, stipulated by uh, MDE and uh, it shows that our ability to uh, improve the water quality discharge off of the site. Again, the uh, water draining from the road, the circulation road, which is shown here, that goes to the back of the campus as well as from the reverse slope berm, will go to a biofilter uh, structure located here and then be discharged. Uh, the parking garage, the access road, visitor control center, visitor parking, as well as the two large uh, pervious areas located on either side of the access uh, will be collected and flow through this structure here. First inch of treated and prior to discharge into the stream to the west. So just to summarize, we uh, are in a pretty uh, tight condition with regard to the available real estate. We have decreased the garage here substantially, uh, have moved it as far north as we can because of this underground oil uh, grit separator that's located here, which is collecting again that stormwater coming off of uh, the bulk of the North Campus site. Uh, needs approximately this amount of real estate here to be constructed as we've shown on this drawing. This is the fence line where we have just off of, just outside this fence line is the stream that basically runs between uh, the Waldorf School, which is down in this area down here, and the Montgomery County Park that's located right here. It's basically the drainage that separates it and there's a pretty substantial drop off several feet uh, from the property down to that stream. So we have this structure that is pretty well uh, shoehorned in between the edge of the garage and the high ground that separates that stream from the site. We have the other stormwater structure located here 
just off of the southeast corner of the garage, which again collects the water from the road surface here, as well as the, the pervious surface that comprises the berm here, into a biofilter, and then discharges again to the stream that goes here. We've been able to reduce the deforestation from 0.75 acres to 0.45 acres in order to preserve uh, the uh, trees that are located again in this generally this southern end of the property or just south of the garage where the uh, uh, woods in good condition are located off of the site there. And that concludes my comments subject to your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Olson, very much. Um, um, you said that you have, uh, oh, sorry. sorry, you said that you have lowered the uh, elevation, but you didn't give us a number by the total. What's the number of feet that the, that the um, elevation has been lowered? It hasn't been lowered since 2 February. What we showed there was the, the elevation at the lowest um, had already been lowered, and the elevation top of parapet for the garage is approximately 275 feet above sea level. Uh, by comparison, Maury Hall, which is the adjacent ex existing structure, is 297 feet above sea level, and Erskine Hall, which is the largest, highest structure existing on the site, is 341 feet above sea level. It's Groundhog Day. You're not answering my question. Okay. My question is, by how many feet have you lowered the elevation of the garage from the original design to where it is now? I don't have that number with me. I don't know. That seems a really important number to me. Okay. We can provide um, that. I'd like to know that. Um, and you, you noted um, that you have an open garage requirement. What does that mean? It's required by whom or what regulation or what entity or? It was a design criteria that was established for the garage. And when the job was bid, it was a requirement of the design build contract that was awarded. Um, and so it was uh, bid and awarded for a dollar amount that would construct the garage, not requiring the fire protection and mechanical ventilation systems for right. a closed garage. So, so, but the design criteria were set by our client, the DIA. So, um, and was there ever a serious look at moving the location of the garage? Yes, ma'am. How serious would, how would you characterize serious? It was serious. It was, it was looked at very seriously early on last summer when we were doing the site development for the project. That's not what I'm asking. Okay. Since the, the December meeting, uh, here was mm -hmm. there a serious look at relocating the garage yes I mean we sat down with the uh, project executive mr. Mansman who spoke to you at the uh, February meeting mm -hmm. and laid out the alternatives and again reviewed the uh, logic and analysis that went into relocating the garage elsewhere on the site in the mid site option and the northeast corner uh, northeast corner options and uh, based on that discussion uh, basically because of viewshed impacts and um, site circulation concerns. Uh, again, where we have it located is the best location. And, and during the course of this serious revisiting of the location, was the option of locating the garage outside of the security perimeter ever considered? It was discussed, yes, ma'am. Was it seriously considered? I, it was determined at that time, but the client's requirements are that it needed to be a within the security perimeter. Was the client consulted with the option? Yes. And they rejected the option? Yes. Okay. Ms. Greenwald? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Mr. Dennis, did you no. have them? Mr. Hart? Yes, I have, I have a question about uh, compliance with the Maryland State Forest Conservation Act. Was a forest and delineation plan uh, prepared and approved? A forest conservation plan was, yes, sir. And is a, a, forest, a, a forest conservation plan was prepared and approved by DNR? Yes, sir. Okay. Now, that was for the original permit that was submitted, and it will be accordingly revised based okay. on the reduced forest impact. Thank you. Uh, 
uh, Mr. May, then Mr. Provencia. Um, first, I, um, I want to say I appreciate the, the fact that there's been, um, there continues to be progress on this project and close coordination with the Park Service with the uh, the two park jurisdictions that are involved, and uh, and I th and I think there's generally been positive feedback from the neighbors, at least from the little bit that I've heard. So I'm it, I'm pleased to hear that there's there's good uh, consultation and cooperation going on. Um, I have to say I'm a little bit disappointed that you haven't gotten all the way to what we were looking for when we approved the master plan, um, and I the. Um, you know, I think the, the the deforestation. Maybe there's more that can be done. I'm probably more concerned at this moment with um, the uh, stormwater runoff situation, because it only takes one really bad storm that you haven't that you know that you your system your new system can't manage to do the kind of damage that that uh, uh, we have seen already in the park. So um, I would strongly encourage that the um, uh, that you continue to work on that, uh, and I and I, frankly, you know, looking at at the the, the 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 very simple diagrams that you showed us, I'm not quite sure I understand why you can't do more to detain water on site. Um, the the treatment th um, structure that you have, um, that's next to the garage entrance, uh, that's underground there. Uh, I don't understand why that couldn't be expanded to be able to hold more water. Is there a reason why that can't grow any larger? And we actually have expanded it uh, by about um, on the order of about 30,000 uh, 30, gallons. It was originally sized 80,000, now it's 110,000. Um, and basically the, the issue that we have is the, the setback area lay down for installing it. We're, we're at the limits of fitting it between the garage and that northern uh, crest, if you will, before you fall off into the stream along the northern boundary. Okay, but but those are essentially two sides of a triangle, and there's a third side of the triangle, which backs it, you know, which which would allow you to expand the hole closer to the road, would it not? I mean, couldn't you expand in that direction? Uh, the issue we have is the uh, denial barriers require underground structures that require uh, space as well as other utilities that are in the area with regard to storm sewer and uh, some other utilities that are located in that mm -hmm. area that, that kind of complement the uh, space there at the north end of the garage. It has been evaluated. In fact, we gave the criteria to the design team following the 2 February meeting to make the structure as large as you possibly can uh, mm -hmm. so we can retain as much water as po or detain as much water as possible on site. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, it sounds to me that that's just an engineering challenge. It's not, I mean, there's no, there's no inherent incompatibility with having a structure at the surface of that nature with a subsurface structure. It just means it would need to be engineered differently. I mean, is there a reason why you can't have that, the, 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 un, the, whatever the retainage structure is below grade, why can't that pass under the, 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 uh, the barriers at the surface? Mm. I mean, is there a reason? I mean, it seems to me that it just, it changes the structure of things, changes how it's engineered and how much rebar you have to put in and, but it doesn't seem like it's inherently incompatible. I think the only issue would be the, the depth at which you would have to build that structure, the uh, stormwater detention structure, in order to have it below grade and have it drain via gravity and still uh, reach the outfall that discharges into oh, the western okay. stream. So you have an issue of slope and grade that you have to So it's address. not a, re a retainage solution um, that there are a concrete solution you need or, or a, a rebar solution, what you need is a pump. And the desire not to, to have that operating complication from a, a, with a stormwater management structure. Well, okay, buy a pump, um, have significant stormwater damage in the park. It seems to me that, that you have to balance that and, and really justify that, and I'm not, I'm not persuaded. Right. So anyway, I would just encourage you to keep working on that, right, push so. the limit. Thanks. Appreciate uh, Mr. May's uh, comments about uh, the stormwater manager as, as, as well as the uh, collaboration with the community. The, uh, the staff report talks about uh, active engagement with the community since February. However, for the record, the attachment going back to December talks about extensive collaboration with the community well before 
the, the February commission meeting. So that's been a, an, on, an ongoing and improving and uh, very important, I think, aspect of this uh, project. On the two specific requirements uh, from our last meeting on the uh, deforestation and the stormwater management, I think the Corps should be uh, commended for the tremendous progress. I, I think if we started, for example, on deforestation with three acres, we're down to 0.45. Uh, the, the Corps was only asked to set a target of 0.25 and you're within two tenths of an acre of meeting a, a target that you were required to meet, you were required to set, but not necessarily to meet or achieve. So uh, as well as the uh, establish or meeting the MDE and ESA 438 standards, I think uh, all reflects very, very well on the core, as well as all the other aspects of planning from the traffic access, working with the local jurisdictions, particularly on the traffic access and egress along uh, Sangamore, balancing security and uh, so forth. So I, I, I continue to be encouraged by, by what we see each time we revisit this project. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you. I'll just... Um, your, your trouble today. I swear it's not operator error for everyone, but um, the... The issue uh, I wanted to comment on that Commissioner May raised uh, is also stormwater, that the stormwater problem isn't merely about the quality of the stormwater, it's about the quantity. So the scouring that occurs when large volumes of water are, are released uh, down that slope, um, you know, into the, into the receiving water is something that could, you know, cause great problems with erosion. So not, so designing a system that that is essentially about skimming oil uh, from the, you know, from the, the, the roads and other surface uh, materials doesn't really do much to reduce that scouring. And, and I have to say, I would like to be sympathetic, except the district has a federal requirement that applies to virtually the entire city to permanently retain um, stormwater from a significant event, not from a, uh, uh, as large an event. So we're talking about a 1.6 inch stormwater event, but it has to be retained, not detained. And we have a lot less land to deal with from, for most of our buildings than, than you have at the site. So I realize that once you've already established where you're going to put everything and you design the stormwater system and the forestation system after the fact, that you're probably not going to have as much success as if it was part of the the design to begin with, but um, you know, I I think that you, uh, Ms. Commissioner May's comment about having to pump. Well, if you put the garage on the downstream side of the site, um, and you don't want to put the retention facility there, yeah, you're you're going to have to pump. Um, I don't see any you know I don't see any way around it. Um, you know, I, I, I guess that, that's my main comment. I, I still don't understand why there's any, why the, the, the literal edge of the garage, if it has to be in the security barrier at all, why it can't just be the security barrier, why there has to be, you know, one inch of additional disturbance, except what you might have to do to actually construct, you know, beyond the wall of that garage, because it's not an occupied structure. You know, it's not an occupied structure. You have the standoff from the rest of the of the building. You know, I, I just don't see why it's necessary. Now, maybe it's a stormwater. Uh, uh, it, it wasn't clear to me, quite, quite frankly, from the presentation, whether that was a security feature or whether that's something that you're putting in to, uh, you know, more to hide the garage. You know, not, not clear, but I just don't get it from a security perspective. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Olson, thank you very much. Uh, I would agree with Mr. Preventure that the Corps has made, uh, especially in recent months, tremendous uh, strides in terms of both community outreach and, and redesign. Thank so you, sir. Thank you for your efforts. Uh, without uh, noticing any additional comments, uh, we've had a long meeting. Thank you all for, for your attendance and your uh, perseverance. And unless there's any further business, uh, this meeting is adjourned. Adjourned.